A very warm welcome to uh, everybody in the room, but also to the about 400 uh, people who are attending uh, online. Um, I extend that welcome uh, very much on behalf of our Director of Studies, uh, Professor Inge Hofer, uh, who unfortunately could not be here today due to illness. Um, we are very glad to, for the second time, host uh, this collaboration uh, event with EU Law Live. Last year, we had a webinar on uh, the judgment of the Court of Justice on the validity uh, of the rule of law conditionality mechanism. Uh, and again, this uh, time we are going to discuss the court because we like discussing the court. Uh, now even more to the point, uh, we are discussing the court itself and the most important procedure in EU law, the preliminary reference procedure, um, specifically the proposal that is on the table to give the general court uh, jurisdiction uh, to hear and rule on uh, a number of preliminary references in areas uh, that have been pre-identified as those relating to VAT, uh, passenger compensation claims, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions allowance trading, um, the customs code and tariff classification, um, and excise duties. Now, the court says in his proposal, that these are areas that raise uh, little uh, points uh, or issues of principle and areas where there is already uh, a substantial body of case law. But where nevertheless, the preliminary references keep coming, uh, making up a substantial part uh, of its caseload. And it has now proposed to transfer uh, this to the general court, which has been enlarged, which now has uh, two judges per member states, as you all know, and thus is in a good position, arguably, to finally start doing what uh, the Treaty of Nice already 20 uh, years ago first saw it uh, could be doing. I think at first uh, face value, this all sounds like a very sensible uncontroversial, reasonable proposal. Perhaps we don't merit the subtitle for this event, a new era for the preliminary reference procedure um, at all. But uh, I do think that we will come to uh, discover also this afternoon that things are maybe not as simple and not as uncontroversial uh, as they might seem at, uh, at the beginning. For me, um, one question that comes to mind when reflecting on, on what we just said, the outline of the proposal and its underlying assumption, is the question, okay, but if the problem is that, there, that the court is spending so much of its precious time on references that don't really raise a point of principle and on which there is already a substantial amount of case law that can guide one to a relatively foreseeable answer, why are these references then still being made? Does this mean that there is something more fundamentally wrong, perhaps, with how we have designed and how we operate the preliminary reference procedure? And that question, is the preliminary reference procedure fit for purpose, so to say, is, I think, a question that has been discussed in the literature uh, and also at the court in the past couple of years and, well, has led to, the, to a number of proposals that go a lot further than what is currently on the table. And what perhaps would be interesting to see also this afternoon, if I may invite the speakers to reflect on that uh, if, they, if they hadn't planned to do that, is indeed how this reform relates to and affects those other proposals for reform that have been made, such as, uh, for one, uh, the proposal by Daniel Sarmiento and Joseph Weiler to introduce an appellate uh, jurisdiction within the court itself um, in response to the, the Weiss uh, PSPP debacle, I guess with a view to somehow settle competence, competence uh, judicially, at the court, 
um, or the proposal uh, made uh, quite a, some time ago by Jan Komarek, but which, which has also been taken up again in the literature to limit preliminary references to courts of last instance uh, uh, with a view to mature the EU legal order, give national courts, well, first of all, re-establish national judicial hierarchies, but also to give national courts more ownership of EU law, treat it more as they treat national law, because EU law is national law, um, instead of externalizing the questions to the Court of Justice as if it is some alien uh, law that isn't part of the national system. Um, and that proposal was echoed, I think, in the opinion by Advocate General Bobek uh, in Consorcio to re revise, revisit the SILFIT um, criteria doctrine, which the court of course, dismissed, and then very shortly after it came with this proposal. So I do think all these things are connected, and I, for one, am interested in discussing how they are. So here to do that is a very impressive lineup of speakers. Um, I have the pleasure and honor to chair the first panel, which will, in a moment, start uh, reflecting in more general, let's say, academic terms uh, on the reform proposal and its, and its context. And for that, we have here, uh, it is my honor, Professor Takis Tridimas, who, of course, many of you here in the room, in any event, will know as their professor here at the College of Europe, but who is also a professor at King's College uh, London, and an authority, of course, on the preliminary reference procedure and many other things. And also very honored to have with us here, Professor Sara Iglesias Sanchez. Yes, I had to check if I didn't, I'm um, sorry. Who has some inside knowledge, perhaps to share, maybe, hopefully, uh, as she was a referendaire at the court, but currently is professor of EU law at the Universidad Complutense in Madrid. We will, after, after that, we will have a general discussion with you, with the audience, and then we will have a second panel, um, which will look at the reform proposal, perhaps from a, a more practical uh, angle, which will be chaired by Daniel Sarmiento, who is, of course, editor-in-chief of EU Law Live, um, but also professor uh, at uh, Universidad Complutense in Madrid. And we have... Um, from the Netherlands to, to <laughs> for no specific reason, uh, two representatives from the Netherlands, Corina Wissels from the Dutch Council of State and Julian Langer, who is professor, but also uh, the head of the EU litigation team at the Dutch Foreign Office and for the European Commission or from the European Commission, I think you prefer <laughs> to said, uh, is Fritz Erlbacher uh, from the legal service. So that is what is on the menu. Um, for the people following online, I should say that you can post questions in the chat, which will be administered by uh, Erichetti, and they will be collected, and then, um, to the extent that there's time, they will be uh, used in the uh, discussions. Without further ado, I uh, pass the floor to Tak Tsudimas. Thank, thank you very much, and the honor is mine to be part of this panel. Now, um, I hope to, to have a paper out very soon, and the title of the paper is the reform of the preliminary reference procedure, sharing uniformity, because this is what it's uh, all about. Uh, let me make first some introductory remarks, explain what the procedure is, what the proposal uh, for the procedure is, uh, and then uh, focus on some aspects of it, and then perhaps later make some uh, wider um, uh, reflections. Uh, so on uh, 30th November 2023, the Court of Justice submitted to the Council a request to amend the statute of the Court under Article 281 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. That provision enables the statute, which is contained in Protocol 3, attached to the TEU, to be amended by the ordinary legislative procedure, save for some fundamental provisions which can only be changed uh, by revising the treaties. And the proposed amendments pertain to two areas. The first is the transfer of certain preliminary references to the General Court. The second is 
the extension of the leave uh, system for appeals um, from the Court of Justice, from the General Court to the uh, uh, European Court of Justice. Both amendments pursue the same objective, namely to alleviate the Court of Justice from its increased, increasing caseload. But um, whilst the second amendment, i.e. the appeal uh, system, uh, builds on an established path of reforms, the first one is a game changer in that it abolishes the monopoly of the Court of Justice to hear preliminary references. These references, um, as uh, I think EU lawyers know well, is um, the crown jewel in the uh, court's jurisdiction. And the possibility of transferring preliminary reference jurisdiction to the General Court was provided uh, first by the Treaty of Nice, which came into force on the 1st of February 2001, uh, but it has not been utilized so far. Um, and the transfer raises, I think, an important question, namely how can the uniform interpretation of EU law be guaranteed when there are multiple, uh, i.e. two in this case, sources of authority? Um, a, a Article 256, paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union states that the General Court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine questions referred for a preliminary ruling in specific areas laid down by the statute. This suggests that the areas where the General Court has jurisdiction must be specified um, in the statute, but it does not preclude the transfer of uh, uh, preliminary reference jurisdiction in multiple areas or indeed giving to the General Court a central role in the preliminary reference system. Uh, it does not mean that the jurisdiction of the General Court may only be exceptional. And uh, we may uh, remind ourselves here of uh, Banking Union and Article 127, Paragraph 6 of the TFEU, which states that the Council may give to the European Central Bank specific tasks on prudential um, uh, uh, supervision. The truth is Banking Union has given a lot of specific tasks to the ECB, essentially elevating it to the uh, banking supervisor um, uh, within the Eurozone. So uh, the uh, allocation criterion, I think, is a, uh, a, a, obviously of critical importance. Under the proposed amendment, the jurisdiction of the General Court uh, is subject matter defined. Uh, it does not depend on the importance of the questions raised uh, in the reference. It does not depend on the seniority of the court that makes the reference. Uh, it does not depend on whether the reference pertains to interpretation or validity, uh, but solely on the area on which the reference relates. And under the proposed Article 50B, Paragraph 1 of the statute, the General Court is to have jurisdiction on preliminary references that come exclusively within one or several of the following specific areas. These are the common system of value-added tax, excise duties, the customs code, and the tariff classification of goods, compensation and assistance to passengers, and the scheme for greenhouse gas emissions uh, allowance trading. Uh, how has the Court of Justice uh, selected those areas? Uh, in its proposal, it states that it has taken into consideration the following criteria. Uh, easiness of identification and distinctiveness. How easy, in other words, it is to identify references that fall within those areas. Uh, the fact that the importance of the questions that arise uh, therein is contained, is there of limited importance. Uh, the fact that there is uh, established case law uh, in those areas, and finally, the volume of litigation. There is no point in transferring uh, a preliminary references to the General Court unless that covers a substantial number of cases so as to free time uh, uh, for the Court of Justice. And according to the Court of Justice, the designated areas represent on average roughly 20% of all requests for preliminary 
uh, ruling. The um, system is based on a verification procedure under which orders for reference are sent to the European Court of Justice, which then decides whether the case should be transferred to the General Court uh, on the basis of um, uh, the criterion of exclusiveness, whether the uh, order for reference, uh, whether the case raises uh, uh, an issue that falls exclusively in one of the uh, uh, designated areas. So I think that is, for us uh, lawyers, uh, the most important technical aspect, I think, of the reform. Uh, what does it mean that the reference must come exclusively within uh, the designated areas? Now, clearly, where a reference also raises issues pertaining to other subject areas, for example, um, a question on the four freedoms or a question pertaining to the interpretation of an EU measure outside the designated areas, then it cannot be transferred to the general court. And uh, to, to my mind, if a reference raises such additional issues, in principle, it is not for the Court of Justice to decide during the verification stage whether the, the questions on those additional areas are meritorious. I think if the National Court, in principle, raises separate questions on separate areas, then the reference should be uh, uh, transferred to the uh, General Court. Uh, to my mind, the verification stage should be as short and as efficient as possible and enter into the substance as little as possible. This is a procedure for transferring jurisdiction. It is not a procedure for sharing jurisdiction between the two uh, courts. Nonetheless, the criterion of exclusivity is not unproblematic, and uh, in some cases, at least, it may not be easy to determine whether it is fulfilled. There are, in particular, it seems to me, three kinds of um, issues that merit closer analysis. First questions pertaining to admissibility and the jurisdiction of the court. Secondly, uh, questions pertaining to effect and remedies. Thirdly, horizontal questions. I will deal with these three, and then I will deal uh, specifically with references on um, uh, validity. So first, questions pertaining to admissibility or jurisdiction. Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, um, the question, I suppose, is this. Should a reference be retained by the Court of Justice where it raises issues pertaining to uh, admissibility or to the jurisdiction of the court? These may include, for example, whether the referring court is a court or tribunal, whether, the, whether it is sufficiently independent, uh, whether the question is hypothetical uh, and therefore inadmissible, and so on and so forth. Now, it could be argued that these questions do not pertain exclusively to one or more of the specific areas listed in Article 50B, Paragraph 1 of the proposed uh, amendment. Uh, nonetheless, to my mind, it is doubtful whether that argument would be correct. And it seems to me that unless the referring court specifically raises a question uh, on admissibility, um, then uh, any such issues which are incidental should be dealt by the general uh, court. Um, I, I don't, again, I go back to what I said earlier, this is not sharing of jurisdiction, this is a transfer of uh, jurisdiction. Um, also, to give away uh, something I, I was going to uh, come to later, the, 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 how the verification procedure occurs, it seems to me that the best way for the verification procedure to occur is simply on the basis of the order for reference. In other words, I don't think it, it is, um, but uh, I mean, that's my view, whatever it's worth, and I may well, I'm, I'm, I stand to be corrected. Um, it, it seems to me it is not the optimum solution to wait for the Court of Justice to hear observations uh, or to receive the submissions of the interested parties and then make a decision whether to remit the case to the General Court. I would 
uh, have thought that the objectives of the transfer are better served by the court making a decision solely on the order for reference. And then it would be for the court of, uh, for the general court to ask if it wishes clarifications to the referring court to um, uh, invite interested parties to submit observations and so on and so forth. So many of these incidental issues on admissibility uh, are best decided after the parties have submitted observations and this is one of the reasons why I think they should be decided by uh, the general court. Second area, questions pertaining to effect and remedies. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, a question very rarely, uh, or at least rarely, refers solely to the interpretation of a provision of EU law. It may re refer to its effect, whether it has direct effect, for example. Uh, how it engages the duty of consistent interpretation, how it might interlink more generally with the principle of effectiveness. Because national courts do not um, uh, send to the ECJ uh, examination questions, they send them uh, questions that will help them resolve the dispute, and these tend to be remedies related. They, they, um, are, are, are dominated by what the parties are asking for in the national proceedings. So uh, such questions pertaining to the effect of a provision within the designated areas may be very difficult to separate from um, uh, the question of interpretation, but they may also be very difficult to separate from the conditions of direct effect or the scope and a, a content of the uh, mar leasing duty. Um, uh, both the provision, the specific provision, say on VAT, and the underlying principle may need to be interpreted. Nonetheless, again, I think that um, a, as a general principle, such questions are for the general court to decide, not for the European Court of Justice uh, to decide. It can become more difficult, um, for example, uh, questions pertaining to liability in damages. They may be a, a question by the National Court on damages. Again, I would take those on a case-by-case -case basis. It doesn't mean that because a question on Frankovich is raised, the case should necessarily stay with the ECJ. For example, the first condition of, of liability is whether the rule breached is intended to grant rights to individuals. That's very similar, uh, albeit no identical, to direct effect. If the general court decides on direct effect, then so it should on this question. There could be a question on whether the court should restrict the retroactive effect of its ruling. Uh, again, I think in principle, I would say, this is not a reason for the ECJ to uh, um, keep the reference. I move on to the third category, questions raising horizontal issues, and these, these are the most difficult questions, uh, because they pertain to the interrelationship between a provision of EU law within the designated areas and the treaties, the charter, or general principles of law. And such issues may arise either because the referring court expressly raises a question pertaining to them, or because the uh, uh, adjudicating court, to give a meaningful answer, will need to address them. Uh, for example, it may be necessary to examine the effect of, of Article 47 of the Charter, or uh, the principle of proportionality on the interpretation uh, of a specific EU law provision applicable. Here, uh, uh, because the case comes by way of preliminary reference, the issue would be the compatibility, essentially the compatibility of a national provision with EU law, um, primarily with the provision which is being referred, but also may well involve issues of its compatibility with general principles or the Charter. So what are we to do in those uh, cases, well, uh, let's start on a case-by-case -case basis. Consider uh, three cases already decided by the Court of Justice, and let's see whether they would be uh, eligible for 
uh, transfer, the first case that comes to mind is Fransum. Uh, now, this case uh, raised, the referring court raised questions relating to the ne bis in idem principle and the scope of application of the Charter. It, it did not um, uh, raise questions on the interpretation of the VAT directive, at least looking at the um, uh, questions referred by the Swedish court. So it seems to me if such a question were to arise, the reference should not be transferred to the general court. It should be decided by the court of justice. A bit more difficult, uh, a case called uh, Cousins, where the request for a reference relates both to the interpretation of the uh, VAT directive, at that time the sixth directive, and to the principle, I quote from the order for reference, that abusive practices are prohibited in the sphere of value added tax. The Court of Justice uh, delivered a ruling which was essentially on the principle of abuse of rights. Um, I think that falls into a gray area. This is a case where the Court of Justice, I think, enjoys discretion. I would expect the court, at least to start with, to keep such cases. I would expect the uh, at, at least to start with, the transfer to be cautious, to be measured. Uh, consider an older case called Salumi. Uh, an Italian court refers a, numbers, a number of questions pertaining to the interpretation of specific provisions on the post-clearance -clear recovery of import duties. Um, and the court essentially doesn't interpret those provisions, uh, gives a, an answer on the basis of the principle of legal certainty and legitimate expectations, because the questions referred raised wider issues on the permissibility of retroactive application of law. Um, uh, it seems to me a case like, like uh, Salumi uh, would be liable for transfer, would, would be more appropriately heard by the general court, because the issues, by, by the time you understand that the case is about um, uh, general principles of law, the, the judicial inquiry is quite progressed. And I think it is for the general court to enter into that uh, judicial inquiry. Questions on validity. Um, I, I think it is correct that the uh, uh, transfer includes both questions of interpretation and questions of validity. Uh, the trouble with validity is that the interrelationship between the designated areas and other areas here is even closer. And why is it closer? Because by definition, a question on validity entails an assessment of the compatibility of the contested provision with a higher rule of law. What would be a higher rule of law? Typically, it would be the treaty, it would be the charter, it would be a general principle of EU law. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but these, these would be the overwhelming majority of cases. And here, the court will need to interpret uh, not only the contested provision, but it will need to interpret also the higher rule vis-a-vis uh, -vis which the compatibility of the contested provision is assessed. So, strictly speaking, uh, no question on validity relates exclusively to the areas of law designated for transfer. But this is not, to my mind, the reason not to transfer them, because if it was, then, they, then questions on validity should have been exempted. Um, so uh, how do we make the um, distinction? Well, I, I think we would need to rely on the order for reference. What is it, what does the national court want to know? Does it want to know something about the interpretation of a, the higher rule, or does it um, focus, rather, on the a, a application of that rule in relation to the contested provision? If it is the latter, then I think the case goes to the general court. If it is the former, uh, maybe we need to uh, think through a bit more. Um, it's not straightforward. Take a recent case. There was a case 69520 Phoenix International. Uh, Phoenix as was F-E-N-I-X. And the question referred 
uh, pertain to the validity of a council regulation implementing the VAT directive. So um, the Court to, of Justice had to uh, first interpret the provision of the VAT directive, which was being implemented by the Council. The, the argument was that the implementing uh, uh, um, regulation of the Council exceeded its powers of delegation under Article 191, Paragraph 2. So the Court in such a case would have to interpret the VAT uh, uh, directive provision. It would have to interpret the provision of the implementing regulation, but it would also have essentially to interpret Article 291, Paragraph 2 to determine the scope of permissible um, a, a delegation, which is essentially what it did in that case. Even though there was no um, specific question, uh, should that be transferred, again, it is a close call. One would need to make an assessment. In my view, a case like Phoenix should be transferred to the, to the general court. Uh, the the uh, issue on the interpretation of the primary rule of law is um, not uh, so prominent in the order for reference as to merit the Court of Justice holding the case. Uh, I've got two more things to say, but I'm not sure. Am I allowed to? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, safety valves, How? what happens if things go wrong? And we, you, we can have here uh, both A type um, errors and B type errors. Yeah, we can have too many cases going to the to the general court cases that should not have gone, or in other words, it would be over over inclusive, or we can have a B type error under inclusion uh, cases that should have gone to the general court, staying with the uh, a court of of uh, justice. And there are essentially three safety valves. One is ex ante; it is the verification procedure that the court carries out. The, the second is the um, elevation, the possibility of the general court sending the reference uh, to the uh, court of justice. So that happens in, in media res, as it were, um, uh, in, the, in the middle of things. Uh, and it is provided by Article 256, 256, paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which states that where the General Court considers that the case requires a decision of principle likely to affect the unity or consistency of Union law, it may uh, remit the case to the Court of Justice uh, uh, for a ruling. Um, so this procedure is optional. Yeah, the, the General Court may do it. It doesn't have to do it. Uh, I think it is an, an exceptional procedure, uh, and the question, I suppose, is when, when does a case raise an issue of uh, principle? It seems to me that this would include an issue that is of wider importance, uh, either for the subject area in question, in other words, for VAT, or for the um, customs classification, uh, or it is of wider importance for other areas of EU law. Um, it must be a, an issue which is likely to be critical for um, many litigants, in other words, likely to give rise to litigation. Uh, and one would, con would use here, I suppose, certain indicia if there, are, if there is conflicting case law, um, if perhaps the general court disagrees with the line of case law that the, general, the European Court of Justice has taken and thinks that it should be revisited, or perhaps if the national courts have raised strong objections to a particular line of jurisprudence taken by the general court. The third line of defense is ex post control, and it is provided by Article 256, Paragraph 3, the third uh, subparagraph, um, uh, under which, after the uh, general court gives judgment, uh, the case may be uh, reviewed by the Court of Justice. This is a procedure um, which was used in the past in relation to 
decisions of the general court issued on appeal from the civil uh, service tribunal. So we have some experience on how the court has understood its review jurisdiction there. Uh, it may not necessarily understand it in the same way uh, uh, here. Uh, there are two or three things to say here. One is, um, should perhaps the criteria, both for the general court remitting a case to the ECJ and for the ECJ reviewing a judgment, uh, should perhaps some criteria be specified in the rules of procedure? I think it probably is a good idea. I think it will um, increase transparency. Um, should the parties have a say? I think that's a, a key point. I suspect the Court of Justice would not necessarily want that to happen. I think it probably views it as an intrajudicial decision. Um, something perhaps we want to come back to. But in a well-functioning system, both the elevation from the General Court to the ACJ and the review by the ACJ should a uh, be really exceptional. There are some procedural guarantees to ensure uniformity. These are to, as I understand it, to appease the member states who have the right to make observation. Uh, and these are essentially that the, there is provision now for the general court um, having advocates general. The idea is that an advocate general will be designated. There will be a specialized chamber uh, in the general court to hear preliminary references. And uh, there is provision also for a higher course formation. Uh, they appear technical, but they are important, and I'm very happy to come back to them. Uh, allow me uh, some wider reflections. Very brief, again, we could be talking here a lot more extensively. The, the first relate to the evils of uh, excessive case law, because I think this is important. It must be addressed by the Court of Justice. There are too many cases. This is an endemic problem, not only at the ECJ level, but also at the national level in many countries. And I think it's good for the ECJ to provide leadership here, you, uh, to, to, to show uh, that a greater efficiency is good news. And I do think that more important cases require perhaps closer consideration in some cases by the Court of Justice. So. Uh, um, I think it, it's an important factor in this development. Um, comparisons with the Act Clare doctrine, um, which is something that uh, <laughs> Sasha mentioned. It's, it's um, yeah. I mean that is important. You can, in both cases, there is some uh, delegation, some secession of authority, if you wish. And it's nice to to compare the two. Essentially, the loss of power uh, via the transfer system is less than the loss of power through a um, wider understanding of the Act Clare uh, doctrine. And um, I think that's something we might want to uh, uh, revisit. And also revisit uh, alternative suggestions. Um, again, as um, Sasha said, uh, you may recall the green light theory that, that came, uh, was uh, submitted some years ago by, I think, um, Advocate General Jacobs, uh, the idea being that the Court of Justice should be a lot more relaxed, and perhaps it can, in, in less important cases, it can indicate, to the, the, it, it would ask the referring court to suggest a solution, and the court can give a green light um, or a red light or look at the case and so on and so forth. Uh, so it does link with the, with the wider perception of, of EU justice, essentially. So conclusions. Um, this, I think, is one of the most important changes to the judicial architecture since the establishment of the communities. Uh, I would say it is the most important since the establishment of the, court, of the uh, general court. Uh, uh, it should be welcomed as a positive development. It will reduce the workload of the ECJ, or at least it has every prospect to do so, and enable it to spend more time on references that raise fundamental issues of law. The adoption of a criterion based on the subject matter of the reference is uh, wise, and the choice of areas to be transferred appears to be well thought out, 
Uh, I suppose if one were to um, audit the proposal, one would look at other areas and see uh, if there might be any other potential uh, areas for delegation. The proposal of the Court of Justice does not mention any such areas. Um, uh, I, it seems to me that the verification mechanism should be as efficient as possible. Uh, it should be transparent and it should be reassuring to the parties in the national uh, courts. Um, uh, I think the test of exclusivity inevitably is going to give rise to challenges, but, um, you know, courts are always faced with making fine distinctions. Uh, uh, otherwise, if things were easy, we would need to go to them. So. Um, you can't have a reform without having these uh, gray areas. Finally, even though the categories of cases to be transferred are limited, it is more likely than not that this is the opening shot. Mm? The Rubicon has been crossed, and experience suggests that by time, institutional powers tend to augment, and in particular, the jurisdiction of the, court of, just, of the General Court to hear direct actions has increased considerably since its establishment, there is therefore every prospect that if the initial transfer runs um, successfully, more subject areas will be transferred. So the challenge of sharing uniformity uh, lies uh, ahead. I'm not sure if it would, be, I think it, 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 the proposal is sensible, but the jury I think is out in comparing it with other ways, uh, more fundamental ways of, uh, of, of sharing uh, the interpretation of EU law. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Before I pass the floor, I would just like to uh, communicate clearly how online participants can pose their questions. So it's not in the chat function, but in the Q&A function, which you can find with the three little dots. If you press the three little dots, then you can uh, choose, you get a drop-down menu, and there's Q&A, and that's how you can post your questions. And now, the word to Professor Iglesias Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Garvin, and thank you so much, Professor Tridimas, for this uh, excellent and insightful presentation, which, uh, which already gives us a lot of food for thought and a lot of uh, very, very important ideas how to, how to undertake the assessment of this important proposal that is going right now through the legislature. I was starting my introduction with a, a phrase that is almost literally one of your conclusions. This is essentially the most important reform of the EU judicial system ever since the creation of the court of, the first, of first instance. This is the moment in which we finally program the biggest challenge in the reform of the, uh, for the future of the EU justice system that was already programmed in the DNA of the treaties and on the DNA of EU courts by the founding fathers of the treaties in the Treaty of Nice. And this gives us a sense of the importance of the debate that is going on on the reform of the Court of Justice, but also gives us a hint about the depth and importance of the debate that has already been taking uh, place in the Court of Justice for more than two decades. Because it has been the court, the, more, the, 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 the actor that has been reluctant up to now to uh, give this step, and we have to think about what has happened now and why has the court given the step now. I will try to adapt a little bit uh, my presentation, so not to overlap and try to cover different issues or some of the same issues inevitably from a different perspective. I will try to focus on uh, five questions. First, the existential question. Is there a stop to this? Is this inevitably going to happen? Should this happen? Or can we reopen the fundamental question of the transfer? Second, are the choices put forward now to the legislator reasonable, the choice for the areas, and are the safeguards enacted in the reform, but already, also already in the treaties, are the safeguards enough? Third, is the balance between courts achieved by the uh, proposal the optimal one? Fourth, is the, le the level of detail 
of the proposal sufficient enough because the Commission seems to take some issue with the level of detail? And finally, how does the transformed EU judicial system look like at the end of this road? I will try to be very quickly in the first, uh, to be very quick in the first questions to focus a little bit more in the second one. So let's open the existential question. Can we go back? Can we just drop this? It will look quite difficult because the court has very carefully uh, explained why now it is the moment and why it was not before. And it has given the legislator a hint, very clear hint, you told us to, you have asked us to, because this question was reopened when the reform of the General Court took place in 2015, and the court was requested by the legislator to come up with a report explaining why or how, why not should we transfer more competences to the General Court. The court considered this in 2017 and gave a number of reasons why it was not the moment. At that moment, efficiency and timing of the uh, preliminary ruling procedure at the Court of Justice was still okay, it was done uh, in time. The, the, the backsliding towards more, uh, more long procedure came afterwards. And uh, it was also the reform of the General Court was very new. It was still being consolidated, so the court felt that it was not the right moment. The court also made some, uh, some uh, considerations of principle. The court very clearly was aware of the disadvantages of trying to define the areas that were clear cut, the areas that were uh, sufficiently severable from the others, and the problems that this entail for the uniform interpretation of EU law. So the court is very, has been very clearly aware of all the problems, and in spite of that, it has continued working to fulfill the will of the legislature to put out a system where the transfer is possible. But also the fact that this transfer is already been sitting not only in the treaty, but also in the statute for 20 years, gives us an idea that the discussion on principle has already been had several times. So now the court has really come up with a system that tries to tackle all these technical difficulties, even though not in a perfect way, because it is, it is impossible, but in a quite optimal and reasonable way that leaves no, almost no room for political reticence, because it might look that the, both the constitutional and the legislative choice of principle has already, already been made. So it will seem like the discussion on the principle of transfer is already foregone. So now let's move to the practicalities and see whether the choices put forward by the court are reasonable and the safeguards enough. First point, the choice of the areas. The court has very cleverly designed an objective system where the areas are not defined as a matter of content or relationship with sensitive areas close to the areas of, of uh, sovereignty to the member states. It could very well have argued that there are some area, areas in the treaty that by its content have constitutional elements on them, citizenship, fundamental rights, the area of freedom, security, and justice. It was, or political, uh, or, or a, um, uh, but, uh, I'm thinking about economic policy, things like this. But the court has avoided to make any any identifications on the basis of substance and has devoted a quasi-mathematical system like an equation, adding several factors, four criteria, that when applied seemingly in a very abstract manner, give us a result that is completely innocent with no, uh, it helps us to situate us before the veil of ignorance so we can just uh, have this, this, this result of the areas. So we have the encapsulation requirement, the specific areas are very identifiable and self-contained. Then we have the uh, absence of constitutional relevance requirement. Then we have the requirement of existence of a substantial body of case law and the criterion of numeric relevance, because this is after all a reform inspired by the needs of efficiency. It is curious that four of these, uh, of these four criteria, three of them are inserted in red recitals of the proposed regulation, but not the one of the absence of constitutional relevance. And for me, this is the one 
in which the court has more leeway to interpret in the future when applying this criteria what comes in and what stays out. Because this is not only measurable by the number of grand chamber cases, but by a number of other kind of, uh, of estimations. Essentially, uh, once we apply these areas, we have come up, we, once we apply these criteria, we arrive at the areas that Takis has already presented to us. But immediately the question uh, pops up. Do other areas fulfill those criteria? And most of all, why all the areas of established expertise of the general court have remained outside? On the first uh, possible objection, yeah, we might very well have other areas, but this is an, an exploration balloon being set out by the Court of Justice. There is no requirement in the treaty of equal treatment of areas of law. If there are other areas where these criteria are met, we could think about public procurement or unfair terms in consumer contracts or motor vehicle liability insurance. Possibly these criteria will be met there as well, but this is something that we leave open for the future. So this is not an objection that could detract us from uh, assessing positively the areas proposed by the court. But what deserves a little bit more of uh, thinking is that the criteria being designed by the court seem to avoid the application of the transfer mechanism to the areas where the, court, the general court traditionally has an expertise. Competition, state aid, intellectual property, sanctions in the common foreign security policy, staff regulations, commercial policy, access to documents, banking union. So all these areas are left outside. And this might be for different reasons that we do not find an explanation in the, in the, um, in the, in the draft uh, request, in the request for a draft amendment sent by the Court of, of Justice. What might be behind that and has been, uh, has been established by very well um, um, reputed doctrine uh, is that there is an avoidance to have a parallelism with the areas in which the Court of Justice will have an appellate jurisdiction and the areas in which the general court will have a preliminary ruling a, uh, competence to avoid a conflicting case lobbying may be very apparently from the appellate part of uh, from the appellate jurisdiction and the areas in which there is a general court uh, preliminary ruling jurisdiction. This might explain that in order to avoid conflict at the upper level, having in mind that the review procedure is there to be really, really exceptional, to have a different, uh, at, to have the, the court of justice correct in the general court on appeal, and at the same time, the general court ruling as a last instance court in the preliminary ruling procedure. So that's what might be behind that. But the thing is that this is only a partial way to avoid conflict because, as we have heard, the system of, uh, of allocation of cases will not prevent that the court continues giving preliminary ruling in the same areas as the general court will give in, be giving preliminary ruling. So this conflict will be out there because the court will continue tackling the cases where there are horizontal case, uh, uh, horizontal uh, questions or where there are questions related to specific areas and non-specific areas. So this collision will might be there. So we might wonder whether the sacrifice in expertise by not giving the uh, general court, at least in some areas, uh, jurisdiction, preliminary jurisdiction in those areas, whether it is worth just to save this avoidance of potential conflict that might happen in, in any case. This is probably something for the future after this first phase is well run up and well established because also in a future, in a future uh, reconsideration or uh, of uh, expansion of the preliminary jurisdiction of the general court, some of these criteria might also be needed to be revisited because probably the court will have more needs to add other things that look reasonable and that do not fit this, uh, this very abstract criteria that the court has given 
to itself that very well rationalizes this, this first attempt, but let's not forget they can also be modified in the next uh, modification of the statute. So also uh, beyond this idea of looking at the criteria and of the, uh, at, at this process in a, in, a, in a dynamic way, there is the issue of the safeguards that come, that is the second point that we might be looking up after the choice of the, of, the, of the areas. Are the safeguards enough? So the, the system relies on some preventive safeguards put in place, which uh, are essentially put in place in the amendment, but then we have the curative safeguards that are already in the treaty. The preventive safeguards for the new system and are first the designation of an advocate general for all the cases, the creation of specialized chambers, and the creation of a new chamber of intermediate size. And let, we will see later on why this is a safeguard. So this all tries to, um, to nudge the general court into respecting or into having a uniform approximation so to say, into having a mini general court within the general court, which is not affected by the fact that the general court is huge now. It has many, many judges. So we need to have like a, like a, a natural reserve for preliminary rulings so we can warranty some not only specialization, but uniformity. They're mimicking some of the classic elements of the procedure before the Court of Justice, where the Advocate General has a look of all the cases, even though he has, he or she doesn't write an opinion in all the cases. So all this will be uh, probably transplanted in, in the rules of procedure of the general court. But the curative safeguards, which are more important from the point of view of the parties and the, and the, and the, and the referring courts, have already been settled by the Treaty of Nice. They are already in the statute. And interestingly, the Court of Justice, even if it could have proposed a reform of the statute of the uh, previously existing review procedure, has chosen to leave as is. Because the review procedure for preliminary rulings was already there in the statute after Nice. The review procedure is now in Article 62 to 62B of the, of the statute. And it determines that it will be only the first advocate general which will who will trigger the uh, review procedure. And the criterion for triggering this is the serious risk for the unity or consistency of EU law. It will be an expedited procedure. The AG, the first AG has to propose, propose within one month. The court has to decide whether to review or not in the next month. And then after that, the, uh, the review procedure will take place if the court has decided so. And very importantly, within all these stages, the effects of the preliminary ruling are suspended. That means that all the preliminary rulings coming from the general court at least will take one month to enter into force. So this adds one extra month, one must not forget, to the delay of, uh, of having a real answer to be applied by the, by the national courts. This uh, new Transfer will resuscitate the zombie of the review procedure that we thought it was dead, but it is not. And we will see whether the case law resuscitates as well and the way it has, it has been applied with regard to the cases on appeal in the rearm of the civil service uh, uh, case law. So uh, this idea of only having a review procedure, of course, enhances the, the role of the general court as a Supreme Court because the parties do not have a say in the procedure. It is not an appeal. The parties, presumably looking at what is already in the statute, will not participate. And I'm not, I, I, I think that the rules of procedure cannot detract for that because the statute already say that it's only the first advocate general. And the system also adds an extra layer that the preliminary rulings coming from the general court are going to be the only ones that will be analyzed by two advocate generals, the one at the general court and the first advocate general at the European Court of Justice. The essential problem of the review procedure is that the, the yardstick for triggering it is very, very high. If we look at the case law, and even if we look at the new case law of the filtering of appeals procedure, which is the yardstick is lower, but still in, in its application, 
is very, is very strict. So here it is important to consider the complementary tool, this, uh, this idea that the general court might uh, devolve the case back to the court of justice. And this devolution, the court can, the general court can consider under the same test. So the, uh, the, the risk of affecting the unity or consistency of EU law. And as Taki said, as it is written in the treaties, it is voluntary. But we may read into it a very, very big if of the principle of loyal cooperation presiding uh, the good functioning of relationship between courts as well. There is a big if because we see that, uh, well, it's the, it's the other sign of the coin of the review procedure, but if the general court sees it before, it will be only a waste of time to wait until there is a review procedure afterwards. So we could say that, yeah, it appears to be voluntary, but there is an element there that will push for an interpretation to invite the general court to, to look at this with, um, with a lot of care. This presents an additional problem besides the, um, besides the uh, voluntary wording of uh, Article 256, which is the lack of, a, of a parallelism between a, a situation where there is a lack of jurisdiction on the general court and the situation where there is a risk for unity and consistency of EU law. Put otherwise, not all the cases in which the general court might overstep the boundaries are to be equated with cases of a super huge risk for the unity of consistency of EU law. And here we have just to look at the statute to Article 54, 54 of the statute that says that where the general court finds that it does not have jurisdiction to hear and determine an action, it shall refer that action to the Court of Justice. So this is, this is not voluntary anymore, and this fits also within this procedure. So if the, if the general court suddenly discovers, because of the observations of the parties, and I totally agree with Professor Tridimas that the allocation should happen before uh, the written procedure. So if this comes up only during the procedure between the parties, we are not anymore under a 2556.3 of the, of the treaty. We are under Article 54 of the statute and the court, the general court must refer the case back to the Court of Justice, or at least is how I humbly read this. Almost a final point, uh, there is what is the balance between courts, what is uh, the balance that the, this, this uh, proposal achieves. There is one interesting point in the allocation system, which is the one-stop shop. So everything will go to the Court of Justice and the Court of Justice will decide. Uh, we published recently a very nice uh, long read by Chiara Malfitano in EULO Live, where she was uh, saying that why, why this allocation system doesn't involve the general court. Why, doesn't, why is not there a mixed panel uh, involving also, I don't know, the vice president or the president of, of the general court? I might think also, or why not the presidents of the specialized chambers? Well, this is a tricky, a tricky question because on the one hand, it will be very good, not also for legitimation pro, uh, reasons, but also to involve the general court from the very beginning so that they know what are the rules for transferring, for keeping a case, and what are the boundaries that shouldn't be overstepped. But on the other hand, this is a system where, the, where both jurisdictions remain independent and the general court might be reviewed by the Court of Justice. So there might be some undue interference in the position on the merits also at the general court. So I am very dubious about the balance of the pros and cons. And I think that uh, it, it, there is a reason why the one-stop shop is to be preferred. Also, uh, relating to the organization, the safeguards put out by the, uh, by the draft proposal relate to the creation of specialized chambers and to the creation of a very uh, mysterious chamber of intermediate size. And the court very clearly explains that this is to avoid recourse to the crime chamber. And this is also something that uh, creates this idea that the general court is, is very big, very diverse. So we have to keep all the preliminary rules jurisdiction within these two 
uh, or three or four, I don't know how many, but presumably within the specialized chambers. And this chamber of intermediate sites, it seems to be aimed to avoid that judges that come from outside the specialized chambers participate in the preliminary ruling procedure. This is uh, likely to create a mini general court within the general court with its own rationale that will that will create some some special or some particular uh, dynamics within the general court that are not uh, entirely positive hierarchies within the general court or uh, hyper specialization or well uh, uh, to to separate uh, to separate uh, general courts with different procedures and different different dynamics here the um, the the proposal or the opinion of the commission points at the idea that the Advocate General may be appointed from outside these specialized chambers, and this might be a way to keep that a little bit more open. But for, uh, from my point of view, the idea of having recourse for, uh, to the Grand Chamber should not be excluded altogether. I do not entirely agree that the cases that should go to the General Chamber are cases that, by nature, are pose a risk to the unity and consistency and should therefore be transferred back to the Court of Justice. This is not what the Court is telling us when the, uh, the Court is telling us that the transfer is not on the basis of importance, but just on the basis of uh, subject matters. So this is something that also takes away one of the safeguards that the rules of procedure provide for parties of the Article 23 of the statute in preliminary release procedures before the Court of Justice because they can ask for the Grand Chamber. So this will be also something that uh, will be that substituted by the Chamber of Intermediate Size. Well, we will have to uh, wait for the next chapter that will be the rules of procedure to, to know what this is going, how this is going to be. And then the level of detail uh, of the reform and uh, the need to explain more things. The Commission, in the opinion, is uh, at least twice, is asking for more clarity and more specification about what are the legal instruments to be covered by the areas, but most of all about how the exclusivity mechanism is going to work. And the Commission already does a little bit of a brainstorm about the uh, areas that should be in and out, and the Commission invites to put this in the recitals. Well, I will be very, very careful about uh, writing anything in the recitals. I think that Taki's, uh, the Professor Tridima's presentation already covered the reasons why, and it's because there is a huge gray area that is a, an evolving gray area that might start being very, very gray, almost black, that means kept by the Court of Justice, and uh, subsequently turning white. So this is going to be a matter of very fine uh, determination of whether an area is exclusive or not, and this will be done almost uh, for sure on a basis of a case-by-case uh, -case basis. For example, the Commission proposes that uh, the, the, the matters regarding admissibility and jurisdiction be transferred with no problem, and I was just thinking about the recent case getting Nobel Bank where the Polish cases, uh, there was a Polish court, one of the new uh, judges uh, appointed under very dubious conditions was asking a court of justice. This was a true question of principle, whether this court was a court or a tribunal or not. Does it mean that all the questions of admissibility shall be kept by the court of justice? Absolutely not. But this should be done on a case by case basis. So to conclude, what are the transformations that we are looking at? How will our futuristic EU judicial system look like? Well, we will have a uh, Court of Justice that has consolidated its constitutional role. We know that a lot of the resistance towards the transferring in the past has come from the fact that preliminary rulings have been created on the basis of questions of constitutionality on some courts. And this gives the idea that this has to be completely concentrated and only dealt by one court, and that otherwise it will have, this will have a negative impact on the trust of national jurisdiction, and this is a system based on trust and confidence. So that was what was the discourse in the past not to have this happen. Now we know that we have a, uh, that 
the preliminary ruling has a constitutional side, but it also has a very prosaic side. We have had cases on toilet paper. We have had cases on the classification of a pyjama. So all these cases, it makes complete sense to transfer to another jurisdiction, but not only because they are unimportant, but because they are specialized and technical. The Commission's opinion has already endorsed the idea, and I think that the idea has already been endorsed not only by the legislator, but also by the treaty. What needs to be endorsed is by the judicial community and by the national judges, and they have to change a bit the way in which they look at the judicial system. We are advancing towards a horizontal decentralization where we have a Supreme Court divided by special areas. The General Court will have to be regarded as final and as maximum interpreter as the General Court of Justice in the specific areas, and the review system will be truly a uh, last resort escape valve for very, very uh, serious problems. So the, this means that the General Court is also consolidated as a Supreme Court. It was a Supreme Court before. It was for the cases coming from the Civil Service Tribunal, and it is already in the cases coming from the, the filtering of appeal system. So this is just uh, amplifying an effect that is already there. But the most important, uh, besides the relationship with national courts and the, the change in mind that they have to operate, there will be also a change in the relationship between the courts. Because what will be the position of the Court of Justice with the case law of the General Court? when they are both interpreting at the same time and at the same level different cases. What will be the role of precedent? Will the court quote and follow rulings of the general court? I think that that is supposed to be the case because these two specialized chambers are going to be treated as chambers of the court of justice. So this is the future. It is in, in, incredibly interesting. We will remain very attentive. And that was all what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I would first like to open the floor uh, to questions here. And there's a microphone that can be passed around. Please use it because that way our online audience can also hear. Alexandros, and then Lena Marie, or the other way around. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, I have one question because you talked about the risk for a uh, uniform interpretation of EU law and um, also the safeguards you talked about uh, ex ante verification, about the ex post verification and the review possibility. And I was wondering whether you think that in terms of methodology, whether that could also be one safeguard measure somehow that if there's a um, sufficient um, degree of methodology in EU law, um, whether that also safeguards uniform interpretation, because if there are several principles and, and lines and methods to follow, then obviously the application becomes um, um, is made in a certain framework. And I was wondering if you think that um, there is a sufficient degree for that, and also if you think that the way decisions are being drafted will change. Because sometimes the court doesn't really explain what methodology it is um, applying or what the reasoning. So what do you think that also that might change in the drafting of the decision? Thank you very much. I propose we take a couple of questions at the same time. So Alexander, let's go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor. So, a procedural question, first of all. Uh, we talked about the position of Advocate General in the General Court. Uh, I think that there is already a possibility of having a judge being an Advocate General in uh, the General Court, and also there is a judge rapporteur. Uh, so, uh, if you could please clarify on uh, this new idea about Advocate General in the Court, if they are going to be nominated, or if it's, uh, or if it's the same procedure that is currently applied. And... Um, 
The second question uh, touches upon uh, what uh, Professor Garben um, has already mentioned, the uh, uh, Silfit doctrine, from another perspective. Uh, why didn't the court examine an idea of a certiorari? Why didn't the court uh, decide to strengthen the criteria for admissibility for certain cases in order to reduce the workload that has increased over time? So, thank you. Guillermo. Yeah, thank you, professors. And my question is a little bit between a clarification and going a little bit more in-depth. So suppose that uh, during, as um, uh, Professor Tridimas mentioned, this case, Phoenix International, where the court had to, uh, in order to answer about the validity of uh, a provision, had also to interpret first the uh, VAT directive. So would a case such as this before the general court, uh, would the general court have also to interpret potentially higher provisions of EU law, or would it have at this point to stop and refer to the court of justice? But more importantly, uh, would the court of justice, the general court, could it potentially find itself in uh, a situation where uh, once it is tasked with interpreting a certain provision, it finds itself uh, a, prob a possible problem of validity. And what should that court do at that point? What should the general court do at that point? Should it uh, try to understand if, um, if the court, uh, I'm sorry, should the general court uh, try to understand whether that issue is still in the subject matter or is that considered something that goes beyond the scope of the reform and then the court should refer back to the court of justice. Uh, I hope I, may, I, I, I was clear enough. I, 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 I do realize it's a little bit of a complex. Uh, thank, thank you. And then answer. that's the last one for this round. And then we have some questions from the uh, audience for a second round. Uh, thank you very much for your very intriguing contributions. My question would be on the notion of caseload at the Court of Justice. As was already mentioned by Professor Tridimas, one of the underlying philosophies for this reform is to alleviate the Court of Justice from increasing case law. This notion of case load, uh, at least in my opinion, is very common, at least in climate change litigation at the Court of Justice, when it comes to um, the court's reasoning as to why not uh, extending uh, legal standing rules um, of uh, individual claimants. My question would be, is this concern for, for uh, caseload in general now a de facto additional admissibility criterion in uh, annulment proceedings in addition to uh, individuality and direct concern? Thank you. All right, go ahead. Yes. Can I get a clarification on the last question? I'm not sure I, I fully understood the, the last question. Sorry. Of course, yes. Um, so according to the case law of the Court of Justice when it comes to climate litigation, one of the underlying philosophies in a way, why not to extend uh, already existing legal standing rules in Article 2, uh, 6, 3, Paragraph 4 on normal proceedings, is because this would open up the floodgate of cases in climate change uh, yeah, litigation. So if we follow this reasoning of the Court of Justice, can we now say that um, a general concern for case load is a new de facto admissibility criterion in annulment proceedings when it comes to climate change? Um, thank you very much. These are all excellent questions. Okay, uh, I'll try and address them briefly. Would the drafting change and the methodology uh, change, change? What I would say is that the, the, this transfer entails uh, a, a change of mind from the point of view of the general court, because it, it's so far the general, it's a court that gets its hands dirty. It finds the facts. Very important. It's direct actions. You have to engage with the, fact, uh, with, with the facts. Now, in preliminary references, you take the facts as granted. You, you rely on what you were given 
in the order for reference. So I think that it, there has to be a change of um, attitude there, and I think the specialized chamber will probably help with that. Uh, although I entirely agree with what uh, Sarah said, she implied it, it's an important issue. It, it, it specialized chambers, especially in this context, may give rise to a kind of hierarchy at the general court. So uh, I think it's interesting to, win, interesting to monitor that. Uh, will the Advocate General work in these cases? It hasn't worked in the previous cases. I, I think it will probably work because uh, it is viewed as a safeguard um, to have an Advocate General. It, it will add to the um, strength, if you wish, to the legitimacy, to, to the force of the judgment of the of the general court. The idea is that a lot more people will have looked at the case, uh, including uh, someone who will perform the role of the Advocate General and seek to uh, address the question referred within the wider context of the legal system. Um, why not have anything like a certiorari? The answer is because that's not the way we do things in Europe. Um, it's uh, the, the general, the, already I think the member states, um, they, they are not uneasy, but they want to make sure that they don't lose con more control, that the Court of Justice doesn't do uh, things uh, without the member states, the governments having the opportunity to express observations. Um, so I, I think if you look at judicial reform uh, and the way it has evolved, this reform, although it's in, innovative, it has the same attributes. It is gradual and it is measured. Um, and I think it, 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 it is the first step. So um, in, in that respect, I don't think it's, it's surprising the way it has happened. Um, should the Phoenix International case go to the General Court? Well, uh, look, there are, there will be a, a good group of cases where the Court of Justice will have jurisdiction, will have, will have discretion, whether to keep them or send them. Uh, I would be inclined to err on the side of transferring cases, not on the side of keeping cases. I think that is the whole purpose of the procedure. Um, so there has, there has to be a good reason to keep it, uh, uh, rather than the other way around. Otherwise, there is no point in, in, in doing this. Um, I, I think there is also a further uh, valve, if you wish, a further corrective mechanism. And this is that in some cases, apart from the verification procedure, the possibility of the general court remitting the case to the ECJ and the ECJ reviewing the judgment, uh, and that is that in some cases, they, they will be composite questions. Hmm? And questions, in other words, that pertain to the interpretation of the designated areas and other uh, uh, questions. Now, these will be kept by the Court of Justice, and it may be that the Court will have the opportunity there to provide guidelines um, or even take on the judgment of the a general court in previous cases. So that it, there will be a dialogue because some of the cases, even though they will um, raise questions that fall within the designated areas, will be kept by the, by the ECJ. Just super quick, but because I think that almost everything was, was answered. On the Advocate General, I think that you were, you were asking, but this already exists, right? So it is true, but it's only very exceptionally applied. For unknown reasons, it was applied very, in very, very few cases in the 90s, never again, because it was not compulsory. So the difference with this system is that now, systematically, for all the preliminary rulings, there will be an AG designated. This doesn't mean that there will be an opinion, but he will be checking on the case. And uh, then, again, also reopening the question of Professor Garben and Chill's feet and why did the court did not follow the marvelous uh, opinion of A.G. Bobek and why didn't we uh, limit the input, the clients, why didn't we give more freedom to national courts, not only freedom, but why didn't we trust them more? 
just to stop uh, pushing last instance score to ask to ask questions. I think that all this debate is coming in a particularly vulnerable vulnerable period for the rule of law and judges in many member states. And uh, it is very important to keep the idea that uh, the system is in place. There is um, a system managed by a very important idea that EU law happens through national courts. National courts are the or ordinary judges of EU law. There is an absolute symbiotic relationship with EU law and national judges that it is not true in any other federal system like systems where certiorari apply. So the, the role of uh, national courts, both on the need to keep the gates, the, the doors open for them, but also on the need to ensure interpretation is very peculiar. And I think that the moment, the historical period uh, right now is very, is very special. And last point, there is no certiorari, but do not forget all the measures that have been taken before in the rules of procedure of the, uh, of the, of the Court of Justice to streamline the preliminary rulings procedure. There is no certiorari, but there are the orders of Article 99 of the rules of procedure, which are essentially kind of a possibility to say very quickly without opening the written procedure, without translating, with, well, translation, translating, yes, but very quickly, giving a summary of the case law and uh, to let the national court decide. So this is th there are important avenues for efficiency that have already been explored and that have been, that were not sufficient, so to say. We are already running out of time, but I'm still going to allow the two questions from the online audience. And then uh, if you may briefly reply, we will then after that pass on to the second panel. Thank you, Professor Garben. There is first one question by Professor Jäger. And he's asking both panelists, uh, how does this reform relate to the 2015 reform, which upon the ECJ's initiative buried the 257 specialized court system? It had been my understanding that the ECJ at the time opted against the 257 path and for an increase of judges at the general court in order to retain full control of overall appeals, as well as all preliminary rulings. The first question is, uh, is this current reform proposal thus an indirect admission that the 2015 choice was unwise? And secondly, whether this proposal means uh, that the 257 system is now really finished for good? And there is another question. Uh, uh, just a second. Um, another online participant is asking Professor Tridimas, uh, a question regarding the jurisdiction assessment by the General Court. If the General Court became able to assess whether a national body is or not a court of tri or tribunal, will the Court of Justice be bound by this assessment? Uh, okay. Um, uh, very quickly, uh, does the system, is, is this a reform and admission that what the Court of Justice said back in 2015, 2017, incorrect. I, I don't think so. I think they, at, at least I found the court's narrative in justifying the proposal persuasive. Uh, we went through a first stage of reform. Um, it was a decision of the member states to double the number of judges. Uh, this has now been affected. Uh, we do have a lot of judges uh, and I think it makes eminent sense to transfer some of preliminary reference. I don't, I don't see this necessarily as being a, an admission that what is happening now ought to have happened uh, back in, you know, seven years ago or, or five years ago. Uh, does this mean that the preliminary reference, the, um, the specialized courts model is, is now not on? I think that prob that's probably right. I think that what we will have is a gradual concentration of the Court of Justice on, uh, uh, on it's what uh, Zara put very eloquently, essentially the Court strengthens its position as the Supreme Court of the Union, and it does that by filtering out um, certain cases. It, 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 uh, some appeals, it, it becomes more selective in what appeals to hear, more selective in what preliminary references to hear, um, more direct actions uh, to the general court. So I think this is happening in a very, uh, in a very gradual uh, way. Um, 
perhaps I owe very quickly an answer to our, to our last colleague from here, because I asked him to repeat the question and then, ignore, and then ignored it. The, there was no intention to do it. I, I think, and the question, remember, was, is it, is it the case that the excessive case, the, the, the case law burden is a consideration for the court? I, I think it is, it has always been. I mean, standing, every legal system has an interest in limiting litigation, uh, especially unmeritorious litigation, but that it's, it's not unmeritorious litigation you're referring to. So I think this has always been a consideration. Uh, all I would say is that I don't think that there is a difference here between the Court of Justice and the General Court. It isn't the case. If you look at the case law and the way it has evolved, I don't think it's correct to say that one of these courts is more favorable to the individual than another. I can think of many cases where a judgment by the general court which was favorable to individuals was reversed by the ACJ, and I can also think of cases where the opposite has happened. And I think that's probably reassuring. It doesn't mean that we have a champion of um, integration and a champion of individual freedom. Uh, I think it is, if it is, generally speaking, balanced, although I can see that in some cases the, the case law has. So I don't think the reform is necessarily going to have much of a, an effect on this. Last word. I don't have anything else to reply, but for the fact that I think that Phoenix should stay with the Court of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> so there we see already how difficult this will be in practice. With that, I close the first panel. Uh, a few minutes to transition the two panels, and, uh, and then we're off again. So we will reconvene. That was a very quick break. Um, and start this second session, which is almost, almost running on time. Um, so in this second panel of um, this event, we are going to stick to the topic, of course, but we're going to change the perspective. And we've been uh, focusing on a more general analysis of the reform proposal so far. And now, although we are still going to be discussing many of those issues that Takis and Sada have been addressing, we are going to shift a little bit and look at the reform from the perspective of, let's say, stakeholders. Um, because the stakeholders are more numerous than the stakeholders I will be introducing today. Uh, but I think that the stakeholders that are present today are a good representation of what is at stake in this reform and who's going to be affected, not just the Court of Justice as an institution. So I'm very happy to introduce, although they were already introduced by Sasha, but for those of you who have joined, um, particularly the online session at this time, I am uh, joined here, I'm uh, in the order of uh, order that they appear in the program. I'm joined by Fritz Elbacher from the Legal Service of the Commission. Fritz is at the moment Deputy Director of the Institutional Law Team in the European Commission's Legal Service. And in particular, and that's why it makes it very interesting to have him here today, he is in charge of this dossier at this time, which is in the legislative procedure. So uh, if you have read the Commission's opinion, which was published yesterday, it was, of course, the Commission's opinion, but it has Chris's <coughs> fingerprints um, in quite a lot of the documents for obvious reasons. Uh, to his left, uh, we're joined by Corina Vissels. Corina, she's uh, state councillor in, uh, uh, in the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, the Council of State of the Netherlands, uh, one of the two supreme jurisdictions in the Netherlands. And Corina is... Uh, uh, is a national judge, is a national supreme judge, and this reform is going to affect national judges in a very relevant way, particularly for those who are handling uh, topics and cases on the areas that are going to be transferred. I would also add that Corina is, at the moment, a Supreme Court judge, but she has a very broad trajectory in the field of EU law. And uh, her trajectory actually connects with Julian's uh, trajectory, because Corina was for many years, agent, head agent of the Netherlands before the Court of Justice, and that's also the third stakeholder who is here today because we have the honor of having the current head of the EU litigation team of the Netherlands um, before the Court of Justice, Julian Lange, 
who is also a professor of EU law. So together with his academic background and his uh, experience at the time, uh, is uh, a good example of, uh, of the stakeholders who probably are uh, in the most uh, intensive way attached to the court, having to plead before the court on a regular basis uh, for agents of the member states. This reform is essential. It touches subjects which are, in some cases, very important for member states, which is, for example, the case of VAT. And, of course, from a litigation perspective, this reform might change things quite considerably for the future. So the European Commission, national courts, national governments and their agents, I think this is a good representation of the, 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 the stakeholders involved in the reform. So I will invite them to make uh, a brief presentation in the region of around 15 minutes each, mostly focusing on the issues, problems, challenges that you see from your respective position. And then we can hold a discussion, which I think is going to be very interesting uh, in light of your, your considerations, which we are eager to, to listen. So in the same order as they appear in the program, I'll first give the floor to Fred Helbach. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, if I may, I would like to uh, put a subtitle to my uh, own intervention. Uh, so the title of the of our day's uh, discussion is the reform of the statute of the Court of Justice. And I would like to add this subtitle, tout change, rien ne change. Everything changes, nothing changes. Everything changes because indeed this is a, a huge game changer as uh, Takis Tridismas has just said, and uh, we're discussing a very important change here. At the same time, for the users, for the users, the national judge, the national referring judge, uh, the parties before the national proceedings, um, nothing much will change. For us, pleaders, uh, we will see different doges. We will see blue doges. But at the end of the day, will there be such a huge change? But still, I agree, it is a very important institutional change, and we need to craft it very carefully, um, and then I think uh, indeed for the users, and that's perhaps the most important at the end of the day, it will go like a lettre à la poste. Now, um, the Commission uh, has adopted uh, on the 10th of March, and I don't know exactly when it was published, but it has been published already, uh, its opinion, as you know, in the procedure for the adoption of the statutes, uh, the procedure uh, which is normally followed is that uh, the proposal is done by the court. It's called demande. Uh, and then the commission makes an opinion, and then it's ordinary legislative procedure. So the commission has now issued its opinion, um, and now it's currently before the council and the parliament uh, for consideration. Now, I will present here some salient uh, 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 aspects of, of this opinion uh, from our point of view, but I will also take the liberty of some academic uh, liberty of, of, of making some uh, words on my personal behalf. Um, the first point that I would want to make, and uh, you will see this in, the, in our opinion, is the Commission has declared it, that it fully shares the objective of this reform. And there's quite an important part of our opinion which we dedicate to this, uh, well, because our opinion is addressed to the Council and to the Parliament. And uh, in, in this uh, circumstance, we feel, we think that we, we are really there also to support the court in this process, in the legislative process. Um, uh, and for, for two reasons. Certainly one reason is efficiency. Uh, but I would like to add this. Uh, efficiency, we are not, we are not downgrading, uh, limiting the number of cases here. The cases are going to stay the same, the number. Uh, for the Institution Court of Justice, but also for us, we intervene at the Commission for each individual case. Efficiency is hence for us not the primary most important point. I think the primary most important point, which we have outlined in our opinion, is uh, that uh, the cases before the Court of Justice, and uh, President Lennart has said this recently when presenting the, sta the statistics of 2022, 
the cases are becoming ever more complex and ever more politically sensitive too. And what is really of importance for us is to make sure that the Court of Justice is able to fully fulfill its task of being the uh, highest court within the, um, in, within the Union uh, legal order. Uh, and indeed, and we have also stressed this in our opinion, for us, this also is in front of the challenge that we have seen recently uh, from a number of um, highest uh, courts in the uh, European Union putting the fundamentals of the Union legal order in, uh, in, in question. And the reply which is constantly given to this, and correctly so, is that it needs a judicial dialogue. It needs a dialogue between the Court of Justice and uh, also the highest judicial uh, bodies in the uh, member states. To do this, it needs time. It needs time to listen to the parties. It needs time to deliberate. It needs time to uh, carefully draft. Um, for all these cases of major importance for the European uh, legal order, uh, including these ones, it is important that the Court of Justice has the time free to uh, spend time on these ones. Sharing the burden on the preliminary ruling procedures is, in our view, the only effective and sensible way to reduce the workload of the Court of Justice. All other options are actually, from our point of view, unconvincing uh, and or ineffective because insufficient. We have issued a negative opinion some years ago when the Court of Justice uh, suggested, proposed to uh, transfer to the General Court the infringement procedures. We thought this was not only an ineffective way because it reduced the burden of the Court of Justice very ineffectively, uh, but it was also a uh, move which was not uh, in favor of the protection of the union legal order because it was, uh, it was combined with an appeal procedure possibility for member states during the discussions, at least in the council. And we thought this was uh, un uh, counterproductive. Uh, limiting further the appeals would also be uh, not a good idea from our point of view, beyond what is now currently foreseen in this 58. Uh, because the appeals are very important for the unity and consistency of the Union legal order, in particular with a general court made up of 54 justices. And this is it. This is what we can do, and we need to acknowledge, and we are with the Court of Justice on this, that the proposal of the Court of Justice is actually the only way forward. It is also because the general court has not only been equipped with additional manpower, but it is also shown that it has really a very strong uh, expertise, that it can also develop a strong expertise, because this is what we are talking about here, develop a strong expertise for very technical matters. And now, despite all the challenges which has, have already been uh, discussed here and which we are going to continue discussing, uh, the Commission has therefore, in its opinion, said that we share this uh, reform. Now. The second point I would like to make is we have also declared that we fully share the, um, the choice that is made by the Court of Justice with regard to the areas transferred. This is both about the parameters as well as the, uh, the areas, the specific areas as such. But we have to know this is a political choice. It is not a mathematical exercise based on these parameters and you put in the machine and then come out these uh, areas. This is a, a fundamentally political exercise, but we, we, do, we do agree with it. Um, now, as um, uh, indeed uh, Sara Iglesias Sanchez has said uh, just before, um, the approach as we also see it, understand it, is to seek to detect the areas where the Court of Justice, uh, the, sorry, the General Court actually is not seized by direct actions, which would then go 
in appeal to the Court of Justice. And why, for the reason she has mentioned, to, uh, to avoid the conflicts of, of, of jurisprudence between the General Court and the Court of Justice. Um, and she, as she has also said, and that we see this, I see this exactly in the same way, uh, this will only be achieved partially. Uh, because there will continue to be decisions of the Court of Justice, which where, in a way, it will have to judge in the turf of the General Court, something that has become the turf of the General Court. And I really see no other way, and I would hope, I say this really uh, in my academic freedom, that the Court of Justice would then indeed cite the, the, the cases of the General Court, because this is the body which will then uh, essentially decide the matter. So um, um, then I will perhaps turn uh, to uh, the next point to go ahead. Uh, we have suggested in our opinion that indeed on a few points uh, the uh, recitals are strengthened of, this, of the modification regulation. Um, well, why do we do this? Because we think this is a matter of, for the legislator. This is really deciding on what is the scope of this reform. Uh, this is not just a technical method. It's really how far do we want to transfer uh, um, uh, the power from the Court of Justice to the General Court. Uh, now, this drafting of recitals will have to be done very carefully. And of course, um, thought is put into this, uh, it will need to be, if this is followed, the suggestion that we have made, it will need to be done in a way which is sufficiently open uh, to serve as a guideline, to serve as a guideline that the legislator gives uh, to the body, but still flexible enough to be able to live not only today, but also in 10 years, when the areas will have changed, uh, where potentially new components even of these areas will have added. But still we think it is important and, and is even more important because we need to um, ask ourselves the question, will we ever know, for example, what does this exclusive that I will also turn to in a second, what does it really mean? Because the decision of the Court of Justice, actually probably a body made up of the president of the court the Vice President of the Court and the Advocate General, uh, that is an internal decision that will be not be recent, will not be published. Will we know what is exclusive? Uh, the decision of the um, um, uh, General Court uh, in each of those uh, decisions, in its rulings, will it, and that's a question I ask, will it say, I think, yes, I agree, I have the jurisdiction. Um, I think it would be a good idea, personal reflection again. Uh, then we would have some better understanding, development of thoughts. If the general court then finds, and I agree here again with what has been said before, that despite the transfer that has been made to it, it thinks, but actually I'm not competent, then again, uh, under Article 40, 54 of the statutes, it would send this back to the Court of Justice without a reasoning. So uh, that, all these are the reasons why we think that it is appropriate uh, that the legislator in its uh, regulation uh, uh, sets out some uh, elements of, some guiding elements on these two matters. The first being, what is a specific area? That is a very difficult task to do, but we are on it. And second, what does exclusively mean? And I'll just spend a few words because this, has in, this is essentially the, the, the million dollar question, as you've said, or the, the, the diff, most difficult nut to crack. Uh, first of all, I think we would all agree that exclusively is the right term because under 256, the transfer is limitative. So exclusively is as such the right term. The key question for us from a legal point of view really is whether questions of admissibility, of international law, of charter, of primary law, etc., 
are they necessarily outside the specific areas of, uh, of that which the, the Court of Justice proposes to transfer? And from my point of view, the reply must clearly be no, because otherwise we have no transfer at all, because there's hardly any, any court uh, procedure in 267 which only looks as, a, uh, um, uh, as on a doctor's table uh, on specific provisions of the regulations or directives. The first point I would like to make is, as I understand it, the only reasonable way in which the decision, the individual decision of transfer can be made is not exclusively on the face of the ref reference of order of reference, not just at looking and reading the, uh, the question as has been put by the referring judge. At the same time, I'm with you, Takis uh, Tridimas, that it, it, does, it should say, be sent sufficiently early to the court. So therefore, as I understand it, there will be an analysis made in the Court of Justice of each uh, reference that comes to the court, looking at what does the court, the national court, really want to know. It's in this context that this famous pro uh, uh, procedure of reformulation actually starts to be taking place, right? And it is on that basis that the transfer decision needs to be taken or not. Just take one example, and you can take hundreds of them. Um, C496-17, the court's, referring court's question is exclusively on VAT, oh sorry, customs uh, implementing regulation. The court looks at the uh, order of reference and says, well, what the uh, referring court actually wants to know is indeed interpretation of this plus the GDPR. GDPR clearly is not one of these areas. Hence, based on this pre-reformulated question, is a, if I may say so, the Court of Justice would have to refer or not refer to this case to the, the general court. The second point, the second point which I may, want to make on, on this um, uh, is, uh, uh, is this. We have, in our opinion, um, as was already said, we have set out some uh, food, for, food for thought. Actually, we think it is, uh, it is some um, guidelines that we suggest, again, to be uh, written in the uh, recitals of the modifying, modifying uh, regulation. Um, it is essentially this. Cases where the charter, primary law, admissibility, etc., are linked intrinsically with the question of the, uh, of the specific area, uh, like consistent interpretation, uh, like where the test that is, needs to be done by the judge under the rule of the specific regulation is essentially the same as under the treaty provision. These go. On the other hand, where autonomously questions of um, uh, admissibility, international law, uh, other provisions of the treaty are asked individually, autonomously, without there being a necessary link with the content of the examination, these stay with the Court of Justice. I know this is not uh, mathematical natural science, but this is the guiding line which we suggest, and on this basis, uh, I would agree, Phoenix International stays with the Court of Justice. Thank you very much. I would have a lot of things still to say, but I will stop here. Thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, now the floor is for Karina. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, I'm one of the stakeholders, actually. It's very nice to be a stakeholder once in a while. Um, so as a national judge, I'm a member of the Supreme Administrative Court in the Netherlands. Um, I do have a particular interest uh, in this uh, reform of the preliminary reference procedure, and I'm therefore very honored and grateful that for the invitation to take part in this panel. Um, we are indeed discussing a groundbreaking reform, um, and 
I would like to point out, and it has been said before, but still I feel the need to stress this, that it does not only affect the two EU courts. Um, it does concern all national courts in all the 27 member states. Um, and I'll come back to your subtitle, nothing changes or everything changes and nothing changes. If that is the outcome, we will be happy. But we have to see whether we come there. Um, so, yeah, the success of this reform will depend to a large extent on how the two EU courts will deal with the various challenges. Um, but they're, they're just not two, these two actors. Um, there is a third actor, which is very important, but it's, it's made up of a very diverse group of national courts in all the member states. Um, and we cannot predict how they will react. I mean, I cannot say, I can only speak for myself or for uh, my court or for what I think my court will do and think. So how we perceive this procedure, a proposal. So first, I would like to clarify that although I'm a Supreme, part of a Supreme Court, um, we are not directly at first instance uh, affected by this proposal because we don't, do not deal with VAT excise duties or the customs code. So in that sense, when we read the proposal, we were quite, okay, this doesn't concern us, we're happy. But then of course that's not true because any reform is necessary if it turns out to, um, to alleviate the burden workload of the Court of Justice and to make the preliminary procedure function because that is in our interest. So then we started to re read within our court the proposal more closely. Um, and so first is some general remarks. Um, we do actually support the proposal and we do support the objectives of the reform. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I was present, pleasantly surprised when I sent the proposal around to my colleagues, like, how do you see this? And we had a discussion about this. Because um, if we do remember, it was even a Dutch judge, Goldmans, it has been mentioned in one of the articles also, in 1989, who said the preliminary ruling reference has been a victim of its success. And that is, that may be a problem. So since then, many reforms have been discussed, has followed, has been introduced, some not, etc. We've all talked about this. Um, but for us, it's really important to ensure that the reference procedure remains successful and that national courts into, are, are happy to continue the discussion with the Court of Justice because in the end, the Court of Justice depends on us sending the references. So it is, I mean, we are sending the, the, the references only if we receive answers that we can work with and on a timely basis. Um, well, as a member of a court, we, we do take the preliminary reference procedure very serious. We, we, we send many questions on a yearly basis. We have been doing so for a long, for a long time, and we take our obligations under SILFIT very serious as well. Um, there's a lot said about SILFIT. Um, we just cope with it now. I mean, it could have been different, but then, okay, we have the Silfit obligation and we just cope with it. Um, but let me also say that judges are <coughs> trained to, to decide upon cases that are put uh, before them. And it is a little counterintuitive to stay the matter and to send a question to the court, because actually you, you want to deal with the EU law question yourself. And in most cases, you actually can, based on the case law of the court, etc. So it's always a struggle deciding, okay, in this case, we should actually ask and refer to the court. But it, it's sort of from a psychological point of view, even if you are very pro, sort of, we agree with Silfit and we, we agree with this whole procedure, it's always very difficult to say, okay, I'm going to send this. Because it, it, in, in the end, in practice, it means that for one and a half year at least, we cannot do a thing. And the parties are waiting for the judgments. But it's not only the case concerned. In most cases, there are dozens of other cases that have to wait. 
And that is a real problem for national courts, if you're talking about workload and caseload, etc. cetera. Um, so that's a sort of, a, that's a, so in, tele, in terms of, uh, well, for the national courts or for a natural judge, it's essential for the preliminary reference procedure to function is that we, we receive answers that are qualitatively good, but even more important is that we receive a question which is clear, an answer which is clear. We need certainty. And even if we do not agree with the answer, I mean, quite often I, I, I think, well, I could have decided otherwise, but okay, I'll, I'll agree with that. I'll go on and I can decide my case. So we want to have an answer, we want to have certainty, but we also want to have it in time. And so even if for a court, from the court's perspective, giving an answer within 16 months or 18 months is, is really um, an achievement. For us, it's quite a challenge. Um, so that, that, that's why we do support this reform. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing, um, the possibility, it has been said before, the possibility to transfer cases to the general court, it's been in the treaty for years, so it's not that unexpected. So for us, it's like, okay, if we send an answer, we are used to sending, <laughs> sending a question um, to the court, and now we have to get used to receiving an answer from the general court. What's the big difference? There, I agree with you. Nothing changes for us. You could say that. Um, and we also agree with the choice made in the five areas. Okay, that's very easy for me to say, to say because we are not affected by it immediately, but it does make sense. Uh, but still, uh, looking more closely, there are many questions that arise. And first is, is the proposal detailed enough? It's been said before as well. Um, can we give a real assessment about how this is going to work out? So if you, you sort of, the year of the first time reading, you think, oh, this looks quite reasonable. We can work with that, fine. And if it will make it more efficient, there's really not a real problem. Um, but then looking more closely, there are maybe some problems. Um, and the first is, and we, no, nobody has the answer, but is, does this actually, is it going to work? Will it in fact alleviate the workload of the, of the court? And what is the expectations of uh, the length of the proceedings for the general court? Because it's said like, oh yeah, we now have so many judges in the general court, so they have time and they can deal with that. It's not really substantiated. So, I mean, they have to learn jo the job by doing it. They have, they, it has been a very different institution. They have not until now dealt with preliminary references. It's a different type of legal proceedings, so how is this going to work? Um, and so, yeah, how realistic is this? These are just questions we're not going to have an answer, and it doesn't mean that we do not trust the reform, but it's still, it would have been nice to get, have some more yeah, ideas or figures about that. Um, the choice of areas, I already said, um, they seem reasonable. I understand the parameters. Um, it seems objective enough. But when we were discussing it within our court, Many said, well, what we do not really understand, why not choose, and Sarah had said this before, areas of expertise that the general court is used to dealing with. And then you have, okay, I can, for example, intellectual property. Um, you could also maybe think these are, this is an area where the parameters would work as well. Um, and how is it going to work? Of course, this is not for us to think about. It's the internal cuisine of the court and the general court, how they are going to deal with it. Um, but there's a huge case law on VAT, et cetera, within the court. So how are, how are they going to manage that this expertise is actually also part of the DNA of the general court in due time? Um, I think that's manageable, but they should really think about that. And it would also be nice to get some assurance about that. Um, yeah, then the uh, procedure, transfer procedure. Um, I think the one-stop shop is, is really, it's a good idea. And it's also for us as a 
sending court, it's a good idea to just know have one address, one digital address. Okay, here we have our questions, and this is our motivation. Please answer. Um, but then I'm still a bit puzzled what would be the best thing if it's, it's really they, I, it should be quick. So one of the questions we had is how long is the delay going to be if they have to study the reference to know whether it's within the court, stays within the court or goes to the general court, if it's going to take weeks, this is another month upon the delay. I'm not so sure. On the other hand, if you base solely on the reference, on how the reference is phrased, and it's like a quick formal procedure that looks nice, but then, yeah, if that's going to work out, I mean, we all know the rephrasing and, and um, or there's even a danger that if, if we want to circumvent the transfer, <laughs> we would phrase the question in such a way that we would have, like, add another field of expertise which is not within the uh, capacity of the of the general court or we would um, refer to the charter or some general principle of law or we would find a way to circumvent the whole thing. I think that's not wise either. So I think I agree um, that there should be some sort of short study uh, before transferring. But this is a personal view. We haven't thought about that really, but the one question was how long is it going to delay the whole procedure? Um, then the exclusivity requirement, yeah, a lot of it has been said about that as well. It really depends on the interpretation um, of that requirement. Um, I do not, we do not object to the idea that it's, it's not upon the referring judge to decide whether the question falls within the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice or the general court. Um, but we are just very puzzled how the court will determine um, whether a, reform, a referral will fall, fall within one or the other. Um, we all know that many, many referrals do not only raise technical questions in one certain field. I mean, it's actually quite rare, actually. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled there how this is going to work out. I do agree. I think it has been said by Sarah as well, and you mentioned that, that the court shouldn't be too cautious about it and it should transfer many cases to the general court because otherwise it's no use starting this whole reform. But it's going to be very tricky. And I don't have the real answers, but it's really, really have to, and we have to trust them for this. Um, Uh, let me see. So, yeah, because there also is this whole idea of circumventing um, the allocation system by the national courts. I mean, I'd hope we would not do that, but there is this risk, of course. Um, and then the final remark, actually, I would like to make concerns the review procedure. Um, because this has also raised some questions within our court, and that is more like what would the procedure look like um, and what will be the positions of the parties. I understand they will not have a position, but still, wouldn't that be a good idea? Um, how much delay will this entail for the entire proce procedure? Uh, and to make the whole transfer and the whole reform a success, the review procedure should be the real exception. But on the other hand, on the other hand, we do have concerns on uniformity and, co and coherence. So this is a really delicate balance. And um, if in the rare event that there is a review, um, it's really important that the court um, limits the delay as much as possible. Um, because as I started out for us, it's really important, maybe not so much the quality of the answer as well as the <coughs> Um, the timely answer. Um, and the last thing that has not been addressed yet and not in the proposal is, will there be a role for the referring court or judge, whether there will be a review or not? I mean, if they decide to review, of course, one could think or imagine that maybe the court will use its, its um, competences to ask questions to the referring court on the matter, or maybe explanations or what did you actually want to ask or whatever um, before deciding on the review. I think that could be an interesting 
uh, way as well. I mean, it does exist. We feel a bit like, okay, this is, we sent, because I think for sort of to understand for a national judge, uh, when you decide and you, you have a case which turns out to be rather complicated, you have this very difficult EU law question that you cannot decide on your own. So apparently it is difficult because it has never been, it's not been éclairé and it's not clear either. So you have to send it and then you send by mail <laughs> your question, your motivation, which you've been working on for a couple of weeks. It's rather difficult to actually phrase the question in such a wording that you receive an answer that will help you. And then for 18 months, it's a black box. You hear nothing. There's nothing going on. As, 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 I mean, I know because I've been there. I know it's been translated. I know the national, the agents of all the member states can have their written observations. I know that there will be a hearing, etc. But we do not know about what's happening at all. We do get sometimes a letter, well, the hearing will be done, or we get a letter. There's no uh, advocate general. We get a letter, it's going to be in order, or we, we it's, it's very minimal. So we're a bit set as, uh, yeah, aside. And then if it's going to be referred to the general court, and then there's going to be a review, I think that can be a bit hard to accept, maybe. And then I'm really one of the judges that is very positive and optimistic because I've been dealing with the Court of Justice a lot. Um, but one has to realize that there are many national judges who are a bit more skeptical. And if it's going to be that difficult, oh my gosh, why send a question at all? So that's the, the risk. Um, so to send up, sum up, <laughs> um, we are positive about it. I've seen a bit, maybe a bit pessimistic, but we are positive about it. We think it's necessary. Uh, there are some issues that have to be uh, clarified, especially the exclusivity requirement. Um, and it's, it's going to be very interesting to see whether the general court will succeed in taking up its new role. Um, but when I look at the initial reactions of, to the proposal in the Netherlands, sort of not only in my court, but also the Supreme Court, we're quite optimistic that this will, that we will continue to trust this whole procedure and to continue our dialogue with Luxembourg. Um, so if it turns out to be nothing has changed, I'm a happy person. Thank you so much, Kalina. Juliet, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Thank you for inviting me this afternoon. As the last speaker, always, then you always have the challenge to uh, come up with some new ideas or thoughts. Um, I'll do my best. Um, talking about the practical perspective, um, and what I'm going to say is not necessarily the views of the Dutch government, uh, even though the Dutch government has transferred, communicated to its parliament in general, I would say, a positive approach, looking at it, at the proposal as it stands, but with questions. Um, so I'll give you my personal views, surely affected by my daily work as an agent for the Dutch government, also being involved in the council working group on this topic. Um, so a couple of general comments and then some points of attention. Um, what I like about this proposal is that it is in, if you look at it, it's just a technical proposal. But I agree with all the speakers before me, it is of a constitutional nature. Because it's, it's changing what the court calls the keystone of the judicial system that we have, the dialogue between the, the courts within the EU. So, and that is so fascinating. We're talking about something very technical. And I guess if you, if you explain at home what we're discussing here, people would say, oh, this is all, but it is constitutional in nature. And, um, and it was, it, is it essential? Yes. Corinna uh, already was referring to uh, Koopman's statement, early statements about uh, there is the risk that this procedure, the prisoner reference procedure, will be a victim of its own success. And 
to a certain extent, we have, we've, we've come to that point where an intervention like this is necessary. And I think if you look at the proposal, it is a, an honest attempt to balance, on the one hand, the, 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 the challenges of the increased workload of the Court of Justice in combination with, I think uh, Frederick already said, it, the, that cases at the court are becoming more and more complex. Legislation made by the legislature in Brussels and uh, is getting more and more complex. So issues that are on the table require more attention. So on the one hand, you have to these challenges, and on the other hand, you have the challenge for the court to um, do its job in a timely manner. And uh, as Corinna said, it's 16, 17 months that a referring judge has to wait before the, there is an answer. And the court has done that because in, in the early 90s, the, the average uh, time was 22 months, 24 months. Uh, so the court has done a tremendous job by reducing the time that a, a referring judge has to wait. And so maybe we've come to that point that it is necessary to refer certain areas to the general court. Um, good things, a couple of good things about the proposal. It's a one-stop sh principle. So the referring judge shouldn't worry about who to send to. It's just one a window, and that is the one you send it to, and then it's up to the court. And yeah, already said, time is essence. So the verification procedure should be as quickly as possible, but at the same time, it should be extremely careful. Because the more false positives you get at that point, you will have to rely on the review procedure, uh, the review mechanism, um, or at some point the, the general court itself says, I'll have to send it back to the court. So one stop, wonderful thing, at the same time, the verification procedure, concise, timely, but um, careful. And will it work in the end? And that really depends on now I'm looking at Luxembourg, at the Kierberg, that's how the court, and particularly the general court, will actually do how in practice, because there are so many issues that will affect the outcome in the way how you, from an administrative point of view, uh, you will actually deal with cases. So against this, this, this uh, let's say, positive background, I have a couple of points of attention. Um, first, the jurisdiction of the general court. Yeah, the one million dollar question. Now, when should we set, when does the case need to be sent to the general court? Um, I agree it's going to be, it will stay a black box in the end because we will never know as outsiders. As an agent, I'll, I could see that there, a case is sent to Luxembourg. And then at some point I will realize that, hey, this case is sent to the general court. I will have a look at the reference order. I would say, hmm, that makes sense. But in some cases you would probably say, hmm, why? Or why is it not sent to the general court? Because it is a decision taken by the president, the vice president, and the, the first advocate general, and that's of course an internal matter. So um, does that mean that we shouldn't as legislators, that, does that mean that the union legislators shouldn't do anything? No, I, I, in that sense, I, 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 I agree, or I, I'm, I'm also very positive about the, the, the need to use the recitals as legislator to at least make more clear what is the framework within which the uh, question of jurisdiction exclusivity is actually taken. Um, and then, how should one approach this question? Um, unfortunately, I, I disagree with that. The reference should be the only, because the reference is just, and the Corinna read <laughs> also the heads. If we just look at the, the reference, the reference says a lot, but doesn't say anything, and it doesn't say everything. And if, if we only look at the reference, 
there might be a, a, an incentive for judges, because there are judges in Europe who are skeptical about this reform. Um, so there might be an incentive for them to draft their reference order in such a way that it is, if you look at that face value, ah, this should go, this should not go to the general court, but this should stay at the, at the court of justice. So to avoid this, but also, and that is more important, more importantly, one should look like at what is the case as well? What is in essence the question what this, co uh, this referring judge was ref um, looking at? So is it a matter of one of these specialized areas as such? Or is there a other question that by just coincidence was raised in one of these specialized areas? So the Ackerberg Fransen case undoubtedly should stay at the Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a VIT case, it is a case about the charter. But looking at the reference order, I, I don't know whether the courts, if, if, if that would be the, the guiding principle, it would be doubtful whether that would, would have stayed at the court. Maybe that would have sent to the general court. But these questions, even if you look at the system, I think that they, these questions should stay with the, the Court of Justice. Um, but even if we take that, just a, a question or a critical idea, what then if the case has been referred to the general court and then the general court starts rephrasing the question, because that's what, referring judge, what, what the court has done, so that we will know that the general court will do so. And what if then by rephrasing, the general court takes in certain other areas and where it becomes questionable whether it's still exclusively within one of these specialist areas. Um, I don't have the answer to that. And in the end, practice will tell us what will happen. But is this then the moment where the general court, if the reporting judge is actually getting to that phase, he would say, oh, I have to send this back? Uh, or do we just continue? Just a point of attention. So the jurisdiction of general court, that was one of the things I wanted to discuss with. The other one is the introduction of specialized chambers. Um, and I really think that is the key to the success of this proposal. Um, if I understand correctly, the general court will have two specialized chambers dealing with the cases transferred to the general court. Um, and here, there, there, there's one institutional thing and there's one, let's say, management administrative thing. And let's start with the last week. In order to, uh, to make sure that, I, had, I don't know if just said it before, there are skeptical views among judges in Europe about whether, yeah, maybe, in a sense, if you psychologically have decided to send the case to Luxembourg, you want your case, particularly if you're from the Supreme Court, dealt with, the, with the, the Court of Justice, because that's your peers. And then the case is transferred to the general court. So psychologically, I can understand that that might be sort of making you hesitant to refer. And in order, I believe, in order to avoid this effect, the quality of the rulings by the specialized chamber is so is key. Quality is determined by people. So the judges, but mostly within the system that we have in the Kierkeberg, the, Kierkeberg, the re referendaires. So the level, the knowledge of, the expertise and knowledge of the referendaires dealing with the special in the in the specialized chambers, I think, is going to be essential to um, the success of this proposal. Um, and an from an institutional point of view, I'm just wondering because we have like five, six areas that are defined as the specialized areas. Will the uh, general court? When they allocate cases to these chambers, use will these chambers deal with the five specialist areas all 
or will they also have within the specialized chambers a specialization? In the sense that they would say, look, this chamber will only do the VAT cases and the passenger right cases, and all the other areas will be done with that chamber. Because then you also increase the possibility of internal learning, uh, specialization, um, and possibly increase quality of what's coming up, and in the end, the acceptance from the perspective of, let's say, this, this, this extremely skeptical national judge. Um, and a last um, point of attention is the grand chamber involvement. Um, and that's from a member state perspective, because uh, the rules of procedure uh, have given the right to member states to ask for a grand chamber uh, involvement if you look at the Court of Justice. So in, in, in light of convergence, one would say, no, no, at the general court, one would have the same approach. But if you look at the proposal and the way it's drafted and the way it's intended by the Court of Justice, the court is, not, is, is hesitant about grand chamber involvement at the general court, because normally speaking, and grand chamber involvement means it's a matter of principle. And so if a member state would ask for a grand chamber involvement at the general court, would that then mean that the general court would have to <laughs> refer the case back to the court of justice? Because then it's maybe a matter of principle, such a principle that it should be done by, should be dealt with by the court of justice. Um, and member states sometimes ask for a grand chamber involvement purely for, let's, let's, let's call it non-legal reasons. Because as a legal agent, um, I have the people at the back who are looking at what we're doing. And sometimes a grand chamber decision is important from a non-legal point of view. So that would, could, that, in that way, there would be an, it could be an incentive by asking for a grand chamber involvement and then having the case in the end being back at the table of the Court of Justice, which is of course not very practical and useful if you look at what is the idea behind this uh, proposal. So a solution or a consideration in this regard would be instead of having a right to the involvement of the grand chamber, having a right to get the intermediate yeah. chamber of nine, and it's also drafted in a, in a very broad way, nine, on nine or 11 judges. So in that way, when I initially read about the intermediate chamber, I was like, oh, what's this again? Why do we get a new type of chamber, which is then only at the general court and which is, doesn't exist at the court of justice? But if, we, if you look at it from this perspective, so you would have a, a, a intermediate chamber of nine or 11. For those cases where, from a member state perspective, it's necessary to have a bigger formation than the formation of five, and staying within the framework of the proposal and not, in the end, getting back to the Court of Justice. Um, so those were three points of attention that I wanted to share with you. Um, but in general, I think um, if you look at the discussions taking place now and what we've heard now, a, pos a general positive approach, but, and this but is a serious but, there are many questions still on the table that need clarification. Um, because the next step, we're now talking about the statute, the next step, if you look at it from a legislative point of view, is the change of the rules of procedure, which will be about details. And knowing us as lawyers, as soon as we get to the detailed level, it's going to be, from a legal perspective, professional perspective, more interesting, but also more burdensome, and it will take time. So um, with that in mind, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the three of you. That was excellent. Really interesting to hear your views. Uh, 
similar, not always coincidental, which I think that makes for a good discussion now. Uh, before I give the floor to the audience and to the online participants, I'd like to throw two quick questions at you and get a first glimpse of your views. And that will warm us up a little bit for, for the discussion. So um, a first question, and I'll give you the floor again in the same order for a quick answer. Um, if the general court is now to assume jurisdiction in these specialized areas, but it's going to rule in a very specific context, which is very different to the context in which the Court of Justice makes its decisions, which is after a decision of the court transferring the case with a provision that when the matter retouches a point of principle, a referral back to the Court of Justice is provided, with a review procedure hanging over their heads, with a whole variety of constraints surrounding the jurisdiction of the general court, do you think there is a risk that the case law coming from the general court becomes more conservative? Mm -hmm. And I say conservative in the sense that it will be a case law that will not take too many risks. And we know that at times the Court of Justice has characterized itself as an institution for taking very significant risks. And I would say that most of the times, maybe always, it has succeeded in taking those risks. But this way of framing the new preliminary reference might, might did actually deactivate some of that freshness and riskiness that we have seen in decades in the court's case law. And the second question, if the general court now is to become the preliminary ruling jurisdiction, you have all uh, experienced the preliminary ruling procedure at the Court of Justice, you'll have your list of uh, own preferences of good practices and bad practices in procedural terms. Now that we are going to have a new court dealing with the preliminary reference procedure, we can have new practices emerging. So, For example, Corina was referring before to the Court of Justice making questions to the referring court and now the general court maybe also making use of that mechanism. That mechanism, it exists, but the court just doesn't use it very frequently, and it could do a much better use of that. If we're going to have a very specialized general court, which might be more willing to engage with the national courts, also having to prove it has to win its, accept its acceptance by the referring courts, maybe we have more questions coming from the general court to the referring courts. I don't know. What would be, and that's just an example, uh, your good practices that you miss from the Court of Justice that could actually be introduced by the General Court now that we're going to have a new court dealing with preliminary references? Fritz. Short answer, question one, uh, uh, yes, uh, question two, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, do I see this risk? Uh, I, no, it's actually the other way around. I don't see this. Uh, I don't see this risk, uh, really, uh, that the, the judges in the general court will be more conservative and, and not allow themselves to develop uh, the law as much as the Court of Justice <laughs> has done. Um, um, I th think, in, in, to the contrary, specialized judges will tend to mingle more with a policy than unspecialized judges because they have uh, um, a lot of uh, a lot of expertise. Um, perhaps uh, we, as the member states and the institutions, will have to have a close eye on, on that. Indeed, um, uh, I, so I don't see this really. I hope that the judgments will be both well formulated and motivated, and at the same time, I hope that the general court will indeed use all the possibilities that will be at its hand in the rules of procedure <coughs> to decide quickly and to decide the cases in a effective manner where, necessar where not necessary, no hearing, no advocate general. And that should be very often the case. Um, so I, s I don't see this risk, no. On, uh, on the question, will there be more questions to the referring court? I think, yes, we see them more and more. We see them more and more, but still not, not in, in any 
a big chunk of, of the cases, but they, they come and yes, I think that that is very much in the DNA of the, of the general courts judges to, uh, to go into the depth and perhaps ask questions. But again, I would really think it is important that the general court uses this exceptionally. And for, for all the other cases where it can give quickly answer to use these possibilities to answer the questions quickly and not go into the last detail because they are interested into this, because they fear the appeal, because next day they're going to hear a case which is on direct action and where they indeed need to feel, feel the, the appeal. Here there is no appeal, there's review, it's very different than anymore. Um. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting point of view to see it within the constraints and then ask the question whether there is a risk of being more conservative. Um, I'm not so sure. I don't don't think so either that there is this risk. So they will probably try to stay to be conservative in the sense that they will try to stay within this these specialized fields and to avoid any matter of principle, etc. So that that might be a risk, I guess. Um, and then it is a very, I mean, the judges working at the general courts um, until now have had a very different type of work as a judge and very comparable to what we do on a national level. You have to find out the facts and you have to really understand what it's all about. And with the preliminary reference, the facts are you take it as it is in the reference. So there could be a risk um, that they, that with the observations from the member states who will say, well, the, the reference, the facts cited in the reference, they're wrong, actually it's different, that they will sort of lean towards that, where the court will say, no, we base our judgment on the reference and on how the facts are stated there and what the national law is, et cetera. Um, so I hope that they will manage to do that in the same way as the court does. Um, but on the other hand, I do think it would be interesting to see if they can go a bit more into dialogue with uh, the national judge, if there is a question that they, they're not sure. Because sometimes we do get a judgment and you say, oh, you should have asked us. If that wasn't clear, please send us a small letter saying, do we understand right that this and this and that. So there, that would be really interesting. But, yeah. Um, briefly. Um... I think it won't deactivate freshness. It will actually activate freshness. Because they want to have their place in time and in history. I mean, it's, it's new. And anything which is new, and that's human, you want to explore that. And I, th I actually think that um, the general courts, um, they will find their way. And they will, because they get their specialization. So at some point, they're their VIT expertise will be there. So it will, de it will actually switch the relationship between the general court and the court of justice. And I'll use that to, to get to your second point, because your question about uh, good practices from the court of justice, to it's already the bottom-up, uh, bottom-down approach. Huh? Like the general court should take in over the, uh, the good practices of the court of justice. But actually, I really hope that the general court will stick to certain things that they have at the moment right now. Because litigating at the general court is completely different from what, what it is at the, at the court of justice. And what I always appreciated is the, um, and it has to do with the type of litigation that they have. Eh? It's the, these direct actions, it's into the facts, and it's about the, the judges, the reporting judge, really trying to understand what are the facts in this case. And there is this, this, this atmosphere on getting to the, the, the facts of the case. Now, this approach, um, keep that. The general court should stay, keep that approach when dealing with the chamber, then dealing with, of course, those who are in the specialist chambers won't sit there for the, the rest of their term. Yeah, they will be really rotating out on well, it's every three years or is it every six years. What is the idea behind it? We don't know. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> but I assume that. But then and so keep the atmosphere and the way you approach legal thinking in the general court that the general court does at the moment when dealing and when they take over anything from the court of justice. Then it is to make the dialogue 
with the national judges as genuine as possible. That's through the rulings, but also using the yeah, possibility of getting clarifications from uh, the national judge, uh, Article 101 of the, the rules of procedure, because that will bring the dialogue on another level uh, further, which will in the end also enhance the acceptance of any ruling by the general court as a court dealing with the prisoner of wrath. Thank you. I think this raises an interesting point, which is the fact that if the general court succeeds in becoming uh, a standard interlocutor, a specialized standard interlocutor of national courts in the fields of EAT, excise duty, etc., then the consequence will be that it will probably receive more references. There is a possibility that if the model succeeds, they will engage and national courts will realize that there is an expert Supreme Court, which is probably something that's quite new because they're used to a generalist Supreme Court, but now there will be an expert EU Supreme Court. And if that works, there is a possibility that they might end up having a considerable number of references, and we will have the Court of Justice with its ordinary preliminary reference jurisdiction as a generalist court with its case law maybe stabilizing, and then the general court with a rising number of cases as a rising star as a result of its expertise. <laughs> and that can create uh, a situation in which I wouldn't say rivalry, but of, of, of many maybe healthy competition between the two jurisdictions might evolve in the course of time. Can I just add to that there, or another uh, aspect of that if it if it turns out to be that that there is a success because they're specialized supreme Europe, uh, court of the european union in these fields this might have a sort of spillover effect and to the extent that what, what we see often now is that um, national judges who are dealing with very specific fields such as competition or uh, tax, uh, direct, indirect taxes or other social security or criminal law, uh, they will say, well, we do not want to send references because the Court of Justice is not specialized in the field. And this is a very typical area and they don't have the expertise, not to the extent as we have. Um, and if they see that there's another court, the general court, who does work function as a specialized court, they might demand the same type of specialization within the court. Maybe. I'm sorry if I have been abusing my position as chair. Now I'm looking at the audience for questions or comments to our speakers. <coughs> Do we have a microphone? <coughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know how to do this despite using it all the time. <laughs> I, uh, so, I mean, that was fascinating. A couple of comments, if I may, more than two. First, um, answering Daniel's question, e e are the constraints imposed on the general court likely to make it timid and conservative? I, I would, it's not obvious to me that they would, because, for two reasons. First, because it's it's a human reaction it's an institutional reaction if you have power you use it secondly let's see what happened with the transfer of direct actions to the general court it, i didn't feel it was timid i think the general court fairly quickly made its own uh, mark on the case law uh, in, in it, it exercised good um, review or, and scrutiny of institutional decisions. So I would not expect them to be more timid. Um, and in the appeals, it did, and in the direct actions, it did so, even though there was a much greater threat, as it were, in the form of an appeal. But it's, it's interesting. We'll, let's see how, how it goes. Um, on the verification procedure and how it should be made, I didn't want to give the impression that I was suggesting that it should be a purely mechanical process. No, certainly it involves an evaluation. I, I don't disagree with that. The question is how, on the basis of what material, do you do the evaluation? 
do you rely solely on the order and you do your additional work as one should to find i mean so i i'm entirely with you on the uh, on the way you phrased the, the issue what is it really that the national court wishes to know the trouble is uh, your understanding of what is the issue may change as you get more information and uh, the question then is on the basis of what information should the the uh, court of justice make that evaluation now if you have a very small group of people making the decision and they do it without any um uh, information on the part of the parties then i think one needs to be very careful there because then you get a the development of a kind of secret case law and and i think it's important to be aware of transparency um and I'm, I have absolutely no doubt that um, a, 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 the, the people that will look at it, whose judgment I respect enormously and will take the job very seriously, will, will, go, will do a good job. But I think we need to be mindful, not least also because of the stakeholders, the national courts, the governments, the, uh, the litigants. So um, I, I think we need to th think through. I don't think it is, uh, no problem is, uh, without a solution, and these are experienced people. So I think uh, how I would approach it, I think along the lines you said, what is it, what is it really that the National Court wants to know? Uh, you look a bit at the case law, you try to get a sense of the case, but I think I would probably, be, I would be inclined to think that um, it, sh it is not an evaluation that should be made after reading the whole file, because then, you, then that's not a transfer. Um, final point, just a reflection, Article 54, because it was mentioned, and I appreciate Article 54 of the statute, the suggestion is Article 54 of the statute may lead the General Court to return a case to the Court of Justice. Um, I suppose that's right. Now, you can read Article 54 as prohibiting it, right? Because Article 54 says that if the Court of Justice thinks that the, it is the General Court who, that has jurisdiction, then the General Court cannot decline. And you can't say that the Court of Justice has decided that during the verification procedure. So we, we need, Article 54 could be interpreted that way. I, I'm not suggesting it is the optimum interpretation, but I think it is something that we would need to it's worth not only thinking through it, but also perhaps clarifying those things in the rules of procedure, simply so that people know where they stand and what is possible to happen and what is not possible to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions before I turn to our speakers? Do we have any questions online, Ariketi? Yes, we have four questions. Okay, so in that case, because we're running out of time, I suggest that uh, we go through those four questions and we put them together with Takis's questions and we make um, a last round of interventions for our speakers. Great. So I'm starting with the first question. Uh, the online participant would like to know the panel's views on the situation in which the National Court itself phrases the question in such a way to circumvent the General Court's jur jurisdiction. Uh, could the ECJ in the referral decision apply an approach similar to Folio Novello and still refer the matter to the General Court? Another question is, would it be worth reconsidering the role of the National Court in the preliminary reference cases, making it a real dialogue? Could the Protocol 16 of uh, the Convention on Human Rights procedure before the Court of Human Rights be of inspiration? There, the National Court can comment on the submissions. Uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so another online participant is asking, would it be worth to reconsider the role of the National Court in the preliminary reference cases, making it a real dialogue? And could the Protocol 16 of the Convention on Human Rights procedure uh, 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 before the uh, European Court of Human Rights be of inspiration? There, the National Court can comment on the submissions. So it's basically a comparison with uh, the Court of Human Rights. And, and then there is another question. 
Um, Professor Inglesia Sanchez suggested that the well-known areas of jurisdiction of the General Court are avoided in order to avoid conflicting judgments with the appellate jurisdiction of the ECJ. This proposition turns the hypothesis of the NIST Treaty upside down. The real question seems to be, what about the architecture of the NIS uh, Treaty in the cherry-picking approach of the proposal? And lastly, there is another question, um, rather a comment. Uh, the participant mentions, I think this reform had to be made because, the recent, uh, because of the recent doubling of the number of judges at the General Court. The ACJ did not have a choice but transferring part of its competence due to its, this last reform of the General Court. All the questions and difficulties raised today explain why the Court of Justice has already been reluctant to implement this reform for years. Okay, thank you very much. So now I turn back to our speakers uh, as a concluding intervention and in response also to the questions and comments. So, Fritz. So, um, uh, Takis, uh, first on you um, on this point. Um, um, I, I agree. I agree that uh, it is not for the Court of Justice to first uh, hear, the, get all the written observations, then analyze this, uh, decide whether the conditions are fulfilled, and then send it down. Because this would essentially uh, first uh, be a, a first analysis by a body already, then well, go ahead and decide. Uh, and second, uh, and second, uh, judges should and do follow the case which they are going to decide while the procedure is, is ongoing. So um, I think the uh, procedure which is envisaged by the Court of Justice, again, this is written nowhere, but this is what I understand is going to happen, is that they would going to receive the order, read the order on the basis of the analysis which is made by the Recherche Doc. Yeah. Um, uh, um, and I think this is also important to say this will not delay the procedure because the court receives it, receives the order, sends it to translation because never forget it needs to send mm -hmm. in, in all the languages. And while translation is, do, is going on, the recherche doc makes this analysis, mm -hmm. uh, the court of justice gets the fish, as it is called yeah. internally, and on that basis, uh, this um, body will, will decide. Um, then the question on circumvention, um, phew, my reply would be même pas peur. <laughs> I'm not afraid of circumvention, really. I think uh, after, uh, after a certain time, uh, judges will get used to having the interlocutor uh, in blue uh, rather than in red. We'll not see it, by the way. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and even more so as they will have in front of them uh, a judge uh, they can more easily speak to in, in very technical terms because it is relatively specialized. Uh, specialization doesn't mean that this judge only does VAT, and I think this is important. We, in our opinion, we, we, we say we fully support the specialization. We even suggest that it's pushed a bit as a general practice in the general court. But it doesn't mean full and exclusive uh, specialization on a matter. It's a, and we use the term with attention, relative, uh, um, um, relative uh, specialization. Um, the, um, the circumvention will not take place, I think, because of this, but it's also because the court will have the power, or this body will have the power on the basis of this fish intelligently see what is in the question. Of course, if the, there is an additional question which the court cannot kind of interpret into the question on the specific area, there will be no other choice at this stage but to keep it with the Court of Justice. And uh, maybe in, in this, as a second stage of the reform plus tard, uh, we will find uh, a good solution to this uh, in order to, uh, to avoid uh, that a case comes to the Court of Justice for, by which 10 questions are on VAT, very technical, blah, blah. And one is on something which is separate um, uh, and um, uh, the Court of Justice will have to decide with this. It's not ideal, but uh, at this stage, it's the price to be paid. Uh, the dialogue with the judges, uh, the national judges, um, to the extent, I think, uh, that it is required by the case, it should take place. 
I don't see that that will be uh, taken up as in, in Article 16 of the protocol of the, of the court, that the referring court has this structural permanent possibility to refer to uh, reply to the to the observations written observations never forget um, all what is produced in writing before the court of justice needs to be translated and all this is the major element of time that's the major element of time question three i'm very sorry i have a question mark i didn't understand the question <laughs> very sorry um, and then question four uh, uh, reform because of the reform. Do we see this reform because of the last reform? Yes. Yeah. If we didn't have the other reform, this would not have taken place. Yeah. Um, I can be quick. Um, I'm, I'm really, it's nice to hear that there will not be a delay um, with the um, initial um, review procedure. Um, that, and, but I do think that then the work of the Recherche en Bloc it's becoming even more important now. It's, it gains importance, actually. Um, the circumvention, yeah, I, in the end, I, do, I also agree it's not such a big risk. Um, it's difficult to predict, but then I also agree that the court has the power to transfer anyway. It has, it has to decide upon just looking into the order, and if there is a clear case of circumvention, maybe it should then motivate that or somehow make clear to the referring judge, like, Okay, this was very nice, but it is a clear matter of circumventing the whole issue, and this is actually a matter of hypothetical issue because you're sort of referring to a general principle or the charter, but to solve this case, we actually only need an answer on this specific uh, issue, and we can send it, transfer it to the court, to the general court. Um, so in the end, I don't think that's a very big issue. Um, the dialogue between national referring court and the court or general court, um, yeah, the whole timely issue is very important, as I said in my initial statements, and um, I'm not very keen on any additional commenting on the submissions. Um, we do receive the written submissions by the member states, <laughs> and especially if we refer, and I sometimes when I read the submissions from my former colleagues, sometimes I'm sort of, ah, oh, please, we said it differently, and this is very political, and um, it, it doesn't happen often because actually the quality of the submissions is really high standard, but sometimes it is very political, and then we just accept it, and there's no need to send in any submissions, and we really trust the court to look into our reference and to take it for what it's worth. So for me, it, it's, it's really not necessary. And on the other, uh, the last answer, uh, last question, I don't have any other comment. Thank you for your uh, clarification so that we're all on the same page. Um, for all the questions, I, the same line as the people, um, the speakers just before me, just one literal thing where I think that a rule for a refer, referring judge might be useful hey, to as the question the, the, the person who asked the question to make it a real dialogue and that is the the double position um, that you have as an agent uh, because an agent what are you you are there to facilitate the dialogue between judges but at the same time, as a representative of the government, you have an interest in the case. And personally, what I always find a very difficult situation is where, as an agent, you get questions about the interpretation of national law. Uh, as an agent, I'm not in charge of the interpretation of national law. I can give an interpretation of national law, but it's up to the judge to decide what is the interpretation of Dutch law. And... Um, and of course, as, 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 as we do that as honest and neutral as possible, but at the same time, we have an interest. If it's a migration case, there is a negative decision by the migration authorities that we want to keep up, up, upheld. So there might be an incentive to, yeah, we, it's not an incentive. It's sometimes you can read legislation in a different way. And so there, this is a moment where I really think that a, extra role for the referring judge is justified. 
in the sense that where you get these questions, sometimes we get these questions before the hearing and then the court asks us to explain during the hearing. So then it would be wise to ask the same question to the referring judge yeah. and say, how do you look at this? But, just, just to comment on that, I agree totally with that. Um, we do some, or often I do not even see uh, in reference that we send, we do not see the questions that the court has sent before it for like consultation de plaidoirie or they want to know uh, how do we, you know, this, this measure in or rule in your national legislation, how should we understand it? And actually there I think it would be wise to send that question to the referring court. And we could, either, because often we could really do that within like one paragraph, within a day, uh, we could be really quick because we know the law, we know how to interpret it. And for the translation burden, it wouldn't be that difficult. Um, and then the court could say, just limit it to one page or two pages. Um, that, that would be an interesting form. Yeah. But that's the only way you don't. No, I would just say that that um, why not interesting procedure, but that could lead to rather sensitive situations where uh, perhaps an agent of a national administration would have to contradict the judge or where the judge starts to, the referring judge uh, starts to, uh, um, uh, to question position of the, of its national authorities. So uh, delicate, but perhaps only there to give information to the, to the court of justice. Um, uh, but again, in writing it's, it's difficult because sure. it needs translation, and orally that could. No, no, no orally it's okay. <laughs> <They're writing. laughs> Very well. Well, I, I think we, we, we did have a, a nice discussion, and I think this is particularly meritorious after three straight hours, almost nonstop, of a session on the reform of the statute. But I think this proves that this reform is not just a reform of the statute. This might be the reform of the statute in a very, very long time. Many issues are still open, but even the issue of what kind of court of justice we are going to have in the future is open as a result of this reform. So I want to thank our three speakers for giving us and sharing with us their insights. This has been a very valuable session in terms of understanding what are the stakes, what are the technical aspects of the reform, but also the long-term implications of the reform. I, thought that, I, I hope this was useful for everyone. And once again, thank our participants, our speakers, and a round of applause for that.